recently learned that uh, Trump will be apparently getting out of the hospital and all of that. So be curious to see what folks' reactions are. If folks are watching and they've got comments that they would like to make, I would love to hear about them right here on the show, which of course is going on right now. Mullins and music and memory. So I do know a number of folks are probably wondering about what's happening in the world and are probably thinking about this uh, latest breaking news. And uh, it'll be curious to see what happens in that regard and what folks do in that regard. So definitely um, paying attention to the world and seeing how things go in that regard. So that is what's happening here. And of course, we are anxiously awaiting to find out more about uh, other news of the world. I do know a number of folks have been paying attention to the sports world as well. I know I got a chance yesterday to watch one of the uh, games. I saw that Miami did pull out a victory and they did pull out that victory on yesterday evening. So they did make the series 2-1. And I think that on Tuesday, they will try to even up the series, even though a lot of folks were thinking that it would be a sweep. It does not look like it will be a sweep this time around. And it'll be curious to find out how things play out in terms of that um, and what's going on in the world of sports. So that's one of the things happening is the playoffs are going on, the NBA finals are going on, and it is the Lakers against the Miami Heat. And I did see that my um, schoolmates, Jay Crowder and Jimmy Butler, that's right, they attended Marquette University just like I did, and they are still in the uh, championship fight. So like I said, I know that they'll try to even up the series. Uh, Jimmy Butler just gave an amazing performance uh, over 40 points, I believe, or something like that. And definitely a lot of assists and a lot of other statistics that were quite impressive. So it was a great game and we are looking forward to finding out more as to uh, how they do in the rest of the tournament. So that being said, that is one of the things that is going on right now and all of that. So that's in the world of sports. Um, and definitely uh, looking forward to hearing more about folks' thoughts on that. And definitely if they are interested in uh, learning more about the world and how the world is going, I am waiting for Dr. Funk to join me and we'll talk about funk music and all of that. And of course, we'll just talk about life in general. So I am waiting for him to join me and I just uh, sent him a reminder link. So hopefully he will be joining very shortly and we can learn more about his thoughts on what is happening in the world. So definitely I am hoping that he will be joining me shortly so we can talk about a number of things that are happening. And there are some other folks that might be joining us as well. So look forward to hearing more and more of that conversation and seeing how that goes. So we do have uh, folks that are joining on a regular basis and I'm looking forward to another conversation and another list of folks that will be the guest on this afternoon show. Uh, where we have all kinds of things going on. And of course, we do like to talk about music. And of course, we like to muse about a lot of variety of things or mull around them, as I like to call it. And of course, we might even share some memories and things along that line. So definitely uh, hope folks will keep tuning in and learn more as to what we've got going on and share their insights and all into all that is going on. So like I said, uh, definitely I'm waiting to hear from uh, Dr. Funk and have him join us on here on this conversation and definitely being involved with our show and seeing more about what he's got to say about the world. Who knows? He might even want to share some things about his thoughts on the sports world. Speaking of the sports world, I am a Milwaukee Brewers fan and they did slip in to the playoffs and slipped right on out because like I said, they got swept in two games and I was a disappointed uh, Milwaukee Brewers fan and I have not seen what the other teams are doing because that was the team I was rooting for being a diehard Vikings fan. So I was sitting there rooting for the Vikings and unfortunately they let me down and we did not get the victory that we were looking for. So we're going to find out hopefully if they can do uh, 
I said it's Vikings, I meant uh, the Brewers, but definitely we'll see if they can do better in the world of the sports and maybe bounce back. The Vikings aren't doing that well either. They did win yesterday. They did beat Houston. So, you know, two teams that are winless managed to uh, play each other and my Vikings did get at least one win. So definitely interested in learning more about what that's going on and all of that. So I've got Dr. Funk in the house with me right now. So I'm glad that Dr. Funk has joined back in our conversation and always good to see Dr. Funk in the house. And he's in there. He looks looking too sharp, Dr. Funk. So I see them threads that you've got on and all of that. So just looking much too sharp in the world. So got the hat and the shirt and everything else sporting. So you are doing quite well, you know, sporting them threads. I'm just in here in my usual casual shirt. I can't sport it like you do. And <laughs> That so, uh, well, you know, we gotta uh, represent, man. Yeah, you represented, you represented quite well. One yeah, thing I was talking about before you got on is I was just sharing yeah, with our uh, listeners and everything that it looks like um, President Trump, uh, who sits over there in 1600, is going to be discharged and everything. So it sounds like he's getting out very early. I know that if it was me or you, we'd probably still be in the hospital or at least under tight quarantine, but we ain't got that kind of clout that apparently he's got. Cause like I said, I know they, I had always heard and I did some contact tracing, uh, like work and everything that you're supposed to stay, uh, you know, quarantined or in the various forms of, uh, confined natures. I had always heard a week to 10 days, but if you're in on Friday and you're out by Monday, uh, I don't see any way that, that mathematically that's 10 days. So like I said, I don't know what kind of new uh, tricks they're doing in terms of that kind of knowledge. But isn't that what you had always heard that you were supposed to stay in for like 10 days or something like that? But apparently he got, uh, uh, what did you remember from the old school days? He got one of them waivers. <laughs> I heard it was supposed to be 14 days. Right. So I, yeah, don't, know. I, I, don't, I don't know what they're doing with him. Yeah, this is exactly. Amazing. That's, that's going to be the thing is what are they doing in that situation? Speaking of which, I know that you're a big time uh, musician and got to all that musical world going. And I do appreciate you coming in here and we'll share our thoughts and all of that. But I know you're also opinionated about a lot of other things as well. I know on our show here in the past, we've even talked about the debate that was held between him and Biden. It didn't look like much of a debate to me, but as a musician and as one that has been engaged in the world, I know that you probably even attended debates. You might have even been involved in school politics or something like that back in the day, or maybe you might even want to run for office yourself one day. But as one that is just a musician and a student of society, what were your thoughts on the debate? And then we'll get into some music conversation as well. But what did you think of what you saw? Honestly, Mark, um, I miss the debate. Um, we're recording our new album. So where the studio is, you know, we didn't have access to um, the debate. But I did hear from a few friends and they said it was kind of comical. I would agree. That's what it looked like. It looked like one big comedy show and all that. Tell our listeners that are watching about the music that you've got coming out as well as uh, what folks can expect from the new album. Like I said, you said y'all are in the studio. So is uh, how many of the songs are out and what new songs should folks be looking forward to hearing from? Well, we have um, a no number of songs that are out. And um, we're working on the new album, which is going to be entitled My Life. And expect the funk. Definitely got to expect life. the funk from Dr. Funk. There ain't no doubt about that. So uh, you called it My Life. So tell us a little bit about your life and why you called it that. I'm assuming that you were sharing a little bit of your own life story. And I'm thinking that that's what some of the songs will reflect on with a title like My Life. So why would uh, you want to give it that title and share a little bit about your life and why you think that that's a worthy title? Because our first album is entitled Love Is, which the singles are out now. And I was joking with my brother Power that you met on our last interview. Right. I said, you know, love is my life. So we decided so what well, the next album should be called My Life because we want to show people that they have a chance in their life to do something because your life means everything. So this new album has a um, 
and conglomerate of different types of funk. We got slow funk, we got the fast funk, and we even gonna put some funk rock on it. Oh wow. And we got some reggae funk. <laughs> okay. Reggae funk. Yeah. Gotta have that reggae funk and everything for sure. Uh, so who are some of the uh, musicians? I don't think I asked you this the last time you were on, but who are some of the musicians throughout your life? And like I said, you've been in this game for a while, but who are some of the musicians that influenced you in your life in terms of uh, both the vision now and the vision in the past? Like I said, I'm imagining that you probably had a number of musicians, whether that's the original masters of the funk or even some of the original masters of the blues, because like I said, I'm a big blues guy, and I've got a uh, blues show that I do on Thursday afternoons on a uh, another station, WCOM, and I used to do one at WNCU on Monday night. So definitely, I've uh, always had a connection to the blues, but I know yeah. that I've got a connection to other forms of music as well, and I know you've got a connection to the blues and to a number of other art forms. So who are some of the folks that influenced you, and how did they influence you? Well, I have to start with number one and will always be number one in my life, my mom. My mm -hmm. mother was a gospel singer, and she sang with the New York Mass Choir. And my mom didn't play. And my mother and my uncle knew I was going to be the wild card when I was born. When I was born, the doctor looked at me, and my mom said, yep, he's the one. Mm -hmm. And uh. She was my biggest influence as far as internally what I'm capable of. And as far as well-known and well-known artists, like some heavyweights, um, I was blessed to meet a lot of famous artists. And one in particular stood out and helped me and took me under his wing was Mr. Maurice White from Earth, Wind & Fire. Okay. And Verdine, his brother. Right. And Lenny White, which was with Return to Forever, mm -hmm. amazing fusion jazz drummer, was my teacher as far as drums. And I had the pleasure of him dragging me everywhere when I was a kid to meet a lot of people in the industry. And uh, he used to test me because a lot of people don't know Lenny White is actually left-handed. Okay. I'm right-handed, so he would make me play a left-handed kit so I could use the other side of my brain. <laughs> and he would put me on a left-handed kit, so it made me work, you know, and then when I get on my kit, you know, it was like, okay, that's why he's doing this. So I ended up being what you might say, um, ambidextrous. Right. So it was, it was a good lesson. Sounds like an amazing lesson that you learned and everything. And uh, what was it like? Did you get a chance to meet any of the other Earth, Wind & Fire people and things of that nature? And of course, you know, you can't be involved in the funk music without having some connection to uh, the founders of the funk, whether that's Benny Worrell or George Clinton or any of those. So I was wondering if you've had the pleasure of actually working or meeting any of those folks that are connected to that part of uh, the funk part of the uh, musical genres. Yes, I did. I had, had the pleasure and the honor. It was so cool of actually meeting George Clinton, the man, Uncle George. And he was a pleasure to talk to. And I asked him, I said, is it okay for me to use the name Dr. Funk? And he said, young blood, go with it. But he said, give 100%. Wow. I, said, I will. And um. Please. That was one really cool moment in my life, you know, because that's that's Uncle George, man. Yeah, you can't go you can't go past the funk because Uncle George is he right there at the gate. Oh yeah, yeah. He's gonna make sure that you actually got the legitimate uh, knowledge and all of that about the funk, unless Uncle George says you're gonna get it. You can't get past uh, anything else. So I agree with you. On that, um, like I said, you also had the pleasure of working. Also had the pleasure of meeting Mars Day. Okay. From the time, and um, he 
pretty much endorsed what I was doing. He said, keep doing it. And he said, don't try to be like other people. Do you. And I said, I'm going to do me. You know, it was, it was funny because we were standing there and he goes, you almost as cool as me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you, man. Well, like I said, you're sporting them feds like him and everything. So definitely you might be as cool as uh, Morris Day and all of that. And Morris Day, of course, played with the time and had the pleasure of uh, playing with the late great Prince. So definitely uh, had some yeah. good uh, genes and some good uh in terms of the musical genes that you are sharing and everything. So definitely while the night might not be birth genes, y'all got that musical genes together and y'all are sharing some great threads in that regard. So that's an amazing thing. And what lessons would you say that uh, the uh, folks that were connected with uh, Earth, Wind and Fire taught you? Cause like I said, you actually were taught by them. So what are some of the lessons other than learning how to play uh, left-handed? And by the way, I'm left-handed. So anytime that both can do things left-handed, I am always glad to hear that just based on my own uh, handwriting and things of that nature. So what are some of the lessons that you learned from the whites? Well, Lenny White is separate from uh, Maurice White and Bernie White. Lenny White right. is a jazz drummer. Right. Uh, Maurice and Verdine, the lessons I learned from them, from Earth, Wind & Fire, is organization. Mm. Understand what it means to be organized as a musician, as a songwriter, as a performer. Mm. Because it's our responsibility when I hit stage, I got to take this audience somewhere. Right. Because they're waiting. So um, I remember the first day I met Maurice White, we did a showcase for Earth, Wind & Fire. And he walked in the room, then Verdine, and then there was um, Al McKay, and I forget who else was with them. And they came in the studio, and they sat down, and I was like, whoa, this is serious. These are actually the guys. And nobody didn't say anything. And then Maury said, okay, you guys play. So we played and we finished. It was like silent. Nobody said nothing. And Maury stood up and he just started clapping. Wow. He started clapping. Everybody stood up and, um, they congratulated us and said, you guys are really good. And, and Maurice pulled me to the side and he said, you're one talented young brother. Okay. And he said, I'm only gonna tell you this once. He said, don't ever stop playing and singing. Mm -hmm. He said, you have, you have that thing. And I told him, I said, I will never stop playing. I'm going to be 89 still running around on stage. They're going to be like, come on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was a really big influence. And I just got to see last year, well, earlier this year at the NAM show, which is the biggest musician show in the world, um, I got to see Verdine again, and it was an honor to see him again. And he looked at me and he kept looking at me and uh, his assistant was like, Verdi? He's like, oh my God, I can't believe it's you. <laughs> no, because it's been a few years since I've seen him. And um, he's like, man, I said, do you remember me? He said, yeah, I remember you. I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is cool. And um, he is one of my, Idols as far as bass, okay. and this is my baby here, or one of them. Uh -huh. And um, I remember being backstage because um, they used to take me to some of their shows, especially the ones in Los Angeles, and just learning and seeing how they work and connect with people, how the energy flows from the audience to them and then back. It's a recycling process. 
So you shoot out energy, the audience get in, they shoot it back. And then you shoot it back to them, which creates a really good aura in the whole stadium. You know, it's just a on cycle of energy that never stops. And it's like love, you know, love is the purest energy that was created. Right. That's why music is so powerful. I don't care what language you speak, what country you're from, you play good music, people might not even understand what you're saying, but they'll start dancing. That's true. It happened to me. I was in Japan. They didn't know what we were saying. This is like back in the 90s. And some people were dancing because they can feel the energy. Yeah. You know? I even had people that normally would not listen to funk or blues or R&B. They were strictly country western. Right. Somehow they ended up at one of our shows. And the man told me when we came off stage and we signed an autograph, he said, you know, this ain't my style of music. And I said, <laughs> okay. He goes, but y'all are good. Right. And I ain't gonna lie, y'all are good. I said, thank you. I said, well, here's a CD. And I gave him a CD. I said, no, you don't have to buy one. Because I felt if this man was honest enough to, to tell me that he don't normally run around listening to this kind of music, but after today, he was into it. You know, and his wife was standing, yep, he don't listen to this music. And she said he will now. <laughs> so it's it's a good experience to um, connect with other entities all over the world because you're giving them something that no one can ever take away, and that's good memories, you know. And that's what connect us with our inner spirit, our memories, you know, like. I can still remember being a kid and my mom cooking macaroni and cheese. Oh, wow. But the real way, <laughs> the way they do it in the church, you know what I'm saying? Right. And it's funny how that just takes you right back. You can smell it. I remember her in the kitchen telling us to get out the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know? So I want to give people memories. They say, we went to that show and that dude jumped off the stage. <laughs> you know, it's like certain memories people remember, you know, and that's why I do this. Definitely. What do you say to folks? I had this conversation with another person here on IBM.TV. They were actually talking to some musicians from around the world, but they were talking about the whole notion of classifying the music. And like I said, I know you're Dr. Funk, so you were definitely seen as a funk musician, but I know that there have been some great folks, jazz artists and others. I think it might've been Miles Davis that said, he just liked to be classified as good music. And uh, you know, there've been others that have said that as well. So what, what are your thoughts about genre classification? Do you like to be classified as a funk musician or do you like to think that you mix a lot of the gumbo of sound, be that funk, be that gospel, be that Latin, be that blues, be that the rest of the sounds that are out there. So I know that you are labeling yourself as Dr. Funk, but do you like the, that funk title or do you like to think of yourself as being more of a musician that can go into different styles? Like you said, your mom was a gospel singer and you've definitely been influenced by other sounds as well. So how important is it for you to have that title of funk music on your in your identity i um i welcome it because it was given to me by the public mm. as far as dr funk but i am what you consider a well-rounded musician i play all styles of musician i mean music sorry <laughs> and um i played country I toured with a country band. I've played blues. I've had my own blues band. I've played punk rock. I've played ska music, which was started in London. 
And I was with one of the biggest ska bands called the English Beat that helped start ska music. I've been in the reggae world. I've also played classical music. So having said that, I want to be classified as a good musician right. and singer because that's and what, what I do. You, and what do you think it is to be a good musician? If somebody had to ask you the definition of a good musician, what is in your mind makes a good musician good? A musician that pays attention. A musician that doesn't play from his ego, but from his heart. And a good singer is someone that sings from their heart and helps you understand what they're singing about. And a good musician knows when and where to place the notes. Mm. Because being a musician, you have a responsibility of making the music sound as best as possible. But you have some people that just want to play and they're not even listening to the rest of the band. Right. To me, that's not a good musician because you're on stage with a group of people that just come to form one, one machine to send out songs after songs after songs. And you can't be separate from all these cats. You have to join together. So a good musician to me is someone that knows how to join, how to be a part of a story, as as opposed to wanting to be the story. You know, you'll get your chance, but you have to play the song first. You know, people don't want to see how many notes you can play or how fast you can play. The song is not about that, unless you're in that type of music like jazz fusion they're telling a story with all those notes you have to understand what was going on and i remember when i was playing jazz fusion because lenny white was my teacher mm -hmm. and i was in that world so i would practice and my mom wasn't really a fan <laughs> of jazz fusion because she, she just said it sounded like a bunch of notes you know i'm like it is a lot of notes, but when you're in that world as a jazz musician, you understand it's up to you and your comrades to explain it to the audience through the song. You know, like Spiral Gyro, right? They explained it through their songs. You know, Miles Davis mm -hmm. he hit two notes, and you're like, I get it, I got it, you know. And one, one of the coolest experiences in my life was meeting B.B. King and sitting down and talking to him. And he told me, he said, take your time. Well. He said, take your time, enjoy it. He said, this is a part of your life. Why rush through it? And I told him, I said, you're the master of playing one note. He said, sit down stage, play one note. You know, make it sing. Him and uh, what was it Lucille? His name of guitar. Yeah, that's the name of the guitar. Yeah, and he told me, he said, "Yeah, me and Lucille, we take our time." Gotcha. I'm like, that. See, that's what I'm talking about. You know. And um, I had to teach some of the younger cats that lesson because I can understand people get excited and, you know, go on stage and you're playing in front of thousands and thousands of people. So your adrenaline is, is like racing, but you have to learn how to control that. Right. And release it when the time is right. You know, like we're on stage and I call out my sax player. Now it's time for him to do his thing. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a, a, like Maurice White said, you know, it's a journey to learn how to control the energy. And once you learn that, then you can control what you do. 
because uh, the stage is my office. That's where I go to work. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, what advice do you, because tell the folks that are watching about the makeup of the band and what advice you give to the young guards, because I know that it's you, your brother, but y'all got other bandmates as well. So who are some of the other bandmates and what is the makeup of the group? Is it uh, all folks from out west? Because I know y'all moved from out here in the East Coast, but um, the bandmates, are they all from the West Coast or are they... Um, a mixture of people from all over and the age ranges and maybe a little bit about their history and how y'all met. So if you just tell folks that are watching a little of the story of the band and who's in the band now and how the band is composed. Yes, we have um, our lineup. The group is amazing. I, I've been blessed because these cats are serious. They don't mess around. Gotcha. And, um, we have, like you said, you know, me, my brother, Power. My brother is phenomenal guitar player. And I was on him. He used to get mad at me because I'd be like, no, practice, practice. And he would get mad. Now he's like, you know, Strutter, you know. And then we have my buddy, Mr. Ray Sapita on saxophone. Excellent musician. And him and himself, he is a good person. And he loves what he does, and he loves what we're doing as a group. And that man can play. Wow. So we got uh, Ray Sapino on tennis sax, alto sax, uh, flute, and then on trumpet, Mr. Brent Williams. This is an excellent musician. Excellent. And that man works hard because I work my band. I work them. <laughs> and uh, Brent, <laughs> he's funny. He's a rhythm. Man, you just make me better every time we do a show. <laughs> I say, well, that's good. And on trombone, we have Mr. Ricky Luches. And um, Ricky is a phenomenal trombone player and a very good personality on stage. He's like me, we can't stand still, you know? And he has an excellent ear. So that's our horn section. And on keyboards, we have Mr. Eric Bearfield, which is his, he has the touch. He has the touch, you know? And me and him as keyboard players, we play really good together. And that's what I was looking for for a long time. Somebody that we don't even have to look at one another, you know, because we're listening. And, and we pick them chords. And sometimes we end up doing stuff on the spot at the same time, which means that we're in sync, you know. And then on percussions, we have Dr. Farad Sarif. And he is actually a real doctor, but he is also a real musician. And he's on percussions, um, congas, and all different type of percussions, and amazing percussionists. And um, his energy, his spirit is so good. And yes, the funk will save you, it will heal you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And on drums, we have Mr. Lamar Brooks because I'm out front now. So I'm not behind the kit unless we do a show where they have two kits set up and I might just get back there and show off for the audience or something, you know. But we have Mr. Lamar Brooks and my little brother is, he is very, um, how do you say, he wants to learn everything. And I love that about him because his heart is open. And he'll tell me, he said, he said, Dr. Funk, man, that ending on that one song, man, that, that made me better, you know, because I'm known for writing endings to songs, you know, where you got to count. So that's all bad. That's the family right there. And then we have two techs, and these guys help us do what we do. 
You know, they do our sound, lighting, help us set up. You know, and, and if it wasn't for these guys, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. You know, you'd be like, why they sound all weird? You know, <laughs> so we, I love our guys, man. Um, Mr. Eric Madeira and Joy Sanchez, uh, two techs. And I love them. And they're very smart individuals. And it's good to have people like that, you know. And the one thing I love about Mind, Body, and Soul, my family, we don't have any ego tripping in this band. You know, not anymore. We had right. to we had to get rid of those members. And you guys know me and my brother joke about it because he has to fire them. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> because I get attached to people, then I don't want to fire them. But you know, if it ain't right, it ain't right. You know, you can't have that going on. So I'm very happy with the family. And tell us about the importance of those tech people, because you talk about the tech folks, and I know that I've got friends that have worked in the tech industry and done some of the uh, roadie work and sound work and things of that nature. So tell us a little bit about your tech folks and also the importance of the tech people to uh, your whole team and everything. I have to say one thing is it's very important. Very important. And um, Eric Madeira, his company is CSL Audio and Lighting. Mm -hmm. And he is a really good sound person. He understands what I'm looking for. Because me and my brother, as we told you in the other interview, we also, you know, do production and was in that world for a long time. And we got known as the dynamic duo so people know when we show up you know like we work with key sweat and midnight star different people they know uh oh here come the dynamic duo we're gonna get this right today <laughs> so i needed to find somebody that had the same attitude as me and my brother on the approach because it's very important especially the style of music we're doing and the size band we have you have to understand how to control this type of band because right. we hit it. And don't be scared. You got to control it. And um, Eric is a really good sound person because he understands frequencies and understand how to blend the songs I write because we have horn parts, string parts, all these keyboard parts going, guitar parts, percussionists, drum, bass. You know, and it's just like we've come across sound guys that just said, dude, I can't handle it. You guys are too big because the sound is big, you know. You know, just like you heard on Gap Band, Earth, Wind & Fire, you know, all these groups were big sounding. Chicago, big, you know. Tower Power, big sound. And that's how we are. So he took it upon himself to actually, when we first met, he came to my house and said, do you mind if I sit in on rehearsal so I can understand how you guys are approaching? I said, yeah. So that's how we all became really close because he took the initiative and I like that. You know, sounds really you good. Y'all got some great sounds and everything. And I want folks to get a little taste of what y'all about. And then I want to continue talking to you and everything about the sound and all of that and about your life and career and everything along those lines. But I do need to put on some uh, spots about some of our shows and all of that. But before we get to that, I was going to let folks check a little bit about your band. So I wanted you to tell folks a little bit about, because I just pulled up one of the videos, a uh, video entitled Do It Right, and this was like y'all's official music video, so it's about a four-minute video, and I wanted folks to get a chance to check it out, because I see you sporting another cool one of your shirts sitting down there in a, what looks like a coffee table uh, situation or like some diner or something like that. So where did you do this video at? And uh, definitely, uh, as I get ready to share the screen, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, this whole uh, situation that you're in with this band and uh, the video that is going on at that particular time. Like I said, I think the song is called Do It Right. So we'd love to know oh, what you've got to say. Right. Yeah. 
you found do it right. Okay. Yeah, it was that was a good experience. Um, do it right is about a man telling a woman, I want to do it right. I don't want to do the same mistakes everybody else is making, you know, and be real about it. So yeah, doing that video was really good. And um, we had a lot of fun. So the, the video was shot in Bakersfield, California. Okay. And the first scene that you see is in a restaurant. Right. And we talked to the owner, he said, he said, Dr. Falk, you guys are welcome. Just tell me what, what you need. I said, thank you. He said, we don't open that section of the restaurant until at night, because he has two sections. Mm -hmm. And so it's all yours. So we had the whole film crew come in and, you know, they did their thing. So on the first scene, you see me talking to Pops, which is right. one of our characters. In every video we have, we have a character in the video. And Pops is a, recur a recurring, um, how you say, character. Because I go to Pops to ask him his advice because I fell in love. And I want to know what I have to do to make this right. You know? All right, so we're going to check out Do It Right and let folks check that out. And then we might come back and talk more about it uh, after we hear it play and all of that. So we're going to let folks check out Do It Right and what that's all about. So if y'all hold on one second and hopefully everything will work out here in the world of computer land as we get ready to try <laughs> to get this thing moving along and everything. So definitely have that happening and also while that's going on if you want to share more of the story dr funk because like i said you know computers yeah. and life have their own moments the the song do it right i actually wrote in the studio while my brother power and the sound tech in the studio that records our songs was playing around they was just fooling around while they were fooling around i wrote do it right the video that you're about to see the song it just came to me, you know, the chords, the melody. And when I finished writing the song, I said, hey guys, they all, hey. I said, um, let's set up to track another song. He's like, what song you wanna do? I said, the one I just wrote. <laughs> and uh, the sound guy looked at my brother, he's like, is he serious? And my brother said, yeah, he does that. He leaves <laughs> him alone for a minute and he writes another song. So that was one of those songs that I wrote. Wow. It ended up being a really good single. It went number one on the Independent Music Network. It was actually one of our first songs to go number one. Yeah. And it's a you know, it's a sexy R and B groove um that a lot of a lot of ladies like. And then we also have a remix to this song. Okay. So it's the cool. Dr. Funk remix to do it right. But we're going to try to get that on very shortly. But while we're trying to work on the technical ends of everything, um, how important is it for you to get that kind of like international um, support? Because I know that uh, definitely here, a number of folks are on Reverb Nation. They're on uh, Spotify. They're on a number of platforms like that. And then, of course, there are those international platforms and all of that. So how important is it for you to get on those kind of platforms? Very important. It's very important because reaching out to, like, um, how do you say, people that are not in the United States and don't live this culture is a big step because their culture might be different, you know, the way they approach things. And we've received some really good reviews from overseas, from, um, Italia and France and China, Japan, London, um, Germany, Canada, because they say our music is different because we're not doing that same old, you know, uh, what they want to call it. I, I can't remember. 
Um, we're straight up organic. We're not mm-hmm. trying to be, you know, where they use the uh, auto tune with the vocals all mechanicalized. It's like, no, sing it. I came from the old school. If you're going to sing it, sing it, you know? And people like that all our songs have a positive message within the funk. Because how important, it, how important is it to have that, um, as you just called it, that organic message and all of that kind of stuff? Because you're right, a number of folks don't always have that organic message. So how important is it for you to try to create an organic message and what to you makes an organic message? So uh, like I said, you talked about this song, which I'm still working on being about romance, but I think you've also had some songs that have dealt with social issues and other things that are going on in the world. So talk to us about what an organic message means to you. It's very important to me and to everybody because Organic message is real. And we have a song that is number three on the charts now called Love Is. And this song, I didn't know when I wrote it, but apparently it's very relevant to what is going on right now. And there's a lot of people that sent us reviews and said, your song is helping us get through this crisis right now because we have the virus, and we also have another upspring of racism. Right. And all these are going on at the same time. So we released Love Is not knowing that this was going to happen. And um, our song, we heard from some very beautiful people in France said, cause you remember in France, um, they had, what was it? The bombing over there? Yes, the bombing. The, bombing. the terrorists. Um, they said they searched for a way to get back to normal after that. And one thing that helped was music. Wow. You know? because there was a lot of people that were um, hurt and a good amount of people that died. Yeah, that's very true. Number of folks died in that attack. And uh, talk to us about the importance of music and all of that. So definitely talk to the uh, listeners and everything about the importance of music and how music means a uh, lot to you and all of that. So I'd love to hear you share that and uh, the importance of music, even in these social changes. And uh, I'm gonna see if this might pop me out, but if it does pop me out, just keep on talking because that means that you're gonna be on the screen by yourself, but you'll still be there, but definitely share with the folks what that means to you and everything. Music is the world to me. It's the world to me because that's what I do. And I've been doing it my whole life. And it's important to this planet. You know, and you had different scientists that have test music with plants. Well, this music can help plants grow, you know, because of the vibrations. And then you also have, you know, there's certain people on this planet that have lost their sight. So they use frequencies and their hearing is is a little above ours and they use frequency and they use music as vibrations. You know, just cause they can't see, they can hear and they know what they're feeling. And I think that is beautiful. I think it's beautiful. And I, I've met a couple of people um, that are blind that came to the concerts and said that they experienced a a wonderful concert, even though they can't see everything, they can feel it and they can feel the energy. And that's what's important. So I wanna say to all the fans and listeners, understand that music can help. And I tell people that music, especially funk, will heal you. 
people go, oh, Dr. Fong, you joke? No, I'm not joking. I'm serious. I've had people come in concert saying they had the worst month of their life. And after the concert, they left the concert in a higher place and said they're going to do something about things that are bothering them. And through our music, they understand the message. So it's very important. All styles of music, good music is important to everybody. You know, it could be classical, it could be rock. If it's good, it's good. It's nothing you can take away from it. You know? That is very true. The music is very important to a number of folks and that's very important that they learn about music and its importance. So I agree with you that that is very important that we learn more about music and what music means to folks. Because definitely it's uh, amazing what goes on in the world of music and uh, how that is so important to folks. So I agree with you on that. that we have so much to learn about music and its importance to the world. Because I just think that music is some of the most important things that go on. So definitely uh, I've learned that myself just from watching life and all of that, that music is means so much to so many different folks. So definitely uh, have to agree with you on that as to how important music is to the world. So um, do you think that music could also help us in, in the sense of uh, what could go on with uh, the world in the sense of the way that our politicians are? Because I sometimes think that they don't know enough about music and hey, all of that. How you so doing, man? I love to hear you talk about that. But first, I think we got the hey, uh, video Bob, playing doing, and hopefully folks can you hear the audio and I'm quick. here to bring that up. Man, I need to talk to you, bro. Yeah, I need some <laughs> advice, man. We need some advice. Advice on what, man? I think I'm in love. Oh, you in love and things. Yeah, in love. <laughs> yeah, in love, man. This is the one. I ain't nothing wrong with that. She's amazing. All you gotta remember is do it right. What? No, I said do it right. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna do it right. I got you. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Yeah, well, keep your head up, gun bud. You know what to do. This is it. I gotta do it right. So I gotta go. I'll check you later, Pop. All right. See you. All right, young bud. Well, keep your head up. Do it right. <laughs> So good inside, girl. I love the way you hold me and I feel so good because you do it right, girl. You do it right. I want to do it right, yeah, come on, I want to do it right, that's why, I want to do it right, tell me what you want me to do, do it right, do it, do it, do it right, tell me what you want me to do, Some people go around the world all the time, but they would never find how to do it right, girl. Yeah. Cause we do it right. Do it right. I love the way you kiss me and die. I do it right. Feel so good. You do it right, girl. Well, you do it right. That's why I want to do it right. Tell me what you want me to do. Do it right. Tell me what you want me to do. Do it right. 
What a great song. <laughs> well, Thank you. No Thank problem. You. Yeah, so that was Do It Right so by uh, Dr. Funk. So definitely folks got a chance to enjoy those sounds and what that was all about. So definitely I think that they see that you got it going on and all of that. So they learned a little bit about what you're all about with that Dr. Funk sound. There you go. Yeah, you can, you can hear them horns too. Oh, yeah, you can definitely hear them horns. Them horns were amazing. So is that the regular horn section that usually plays with you? Um, that was our older section. Um, so we have um, the new cast. You know, like I said, you know, you go to different people. Oh yeah, because it's that video was done a while ago. Right. So, um, but um, that is Ray Sapita, which is still with us. Okay. And um, and he's amazing, amazing cat. Now, the actors, were those just members of the band? I know I saw you there, but the other folks, like the young lady and the other folks, were those uh, folks that you recruited to act in the video, or were these uh, professional actors as musicians, or how did y'all go about getting folks for that particular music video, which you did a few years back, and are there plans to do other music videos, and how would folks get involved with that if they're in the acting field and live out there in the West Coast and want to get involved? Yes. Um... The young lady you saw, her name was Carla Young, uh -huh. and she is a uh, actress and model, and a couple of other people that you saw were just extras that we just used in the video because we had to get the video done and didn't seem to work out with all these other people's schedules. So the director said, "Hey, look, mm. let's do this. Let's go ahead and do the video, and we'll make it happen." And I said, "Okay." And we did. And yes, we have uh, a video that's out that you can find that we did with Mr. Pete Escovito, which is Sheila E's dad. Um, right. It's called Just a Matter of Time. There's an actual video um, to the song, which is really nice video. I think you enjoy it. And um, if you can find it, you can play it. Um, okay. What's that, that video, video called? That video has, has touched a lot of people. What's okay. that video called? I'll see if I can't find it and everything, but what's that video? Uh, the it's, title uh, of that one? It's called Just a Matter of Time, and it's on um, Vivo. So if you're on YouTube and you put in v Vivo, Just a Matter of Time, Mind, Body, and Soul, it should come up. And it's on our YouTube page also. Okay. Just a matter of time, we'll try to see if they can't get that going and all of that. But definitely, I think that uh, folks will definitely be amazed. Tell folks what it was like uh, meeting uh, Pete Escovito. Like I said, I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Sheila E. a couple of times, and I think that she's truly amazing. I know that that's her father and everything. So definitely, what was it like meeting um Pete, and did you get a chance to meet uh, Sheila at all? And what was the experience like uh, working with Pete Escovito? Well, it's so funny because I actually met Sheila first, but um, she was amazing. Um, I was playing in Lake Tahoe with a band called Image 82. And we was playing at Caesar's Palace when it was up there. Now it's called Mont Blue. But we were playing at the Caesar's Palace. And I don't know, Sheila Lee happened to be up there for something. I don't know what. And her and the whole, whole party came in. And um, I remember the monitor guy, he came on stage and he was like, hey, uh, Sheila E's here. I'm like, like Shilly, E, Shilly. He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And um, so I told the rest of the band, and um, 
the the lead singer announced, "Oh, Shelly's here!" Da, 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 da. Everybody gave her applause, and she stood up and stuff. And you know how Shelly is; she's she she's like me. She loves music, right? And so we asked her to, to come sit in with us, and she did. And we brought the house down, brought right. the house down. It, it was a lot of fun. And then um, years, years later, I had came home. I was on tour. I came home on break. And me and my brother was going to have like a pizza night. You know, mm. I was like, yeah, just some pizzas, some movies, you know, I have some friends over. And I get a call. It's Pete's manager. He said, is this Rhythm Epkins? And I said, yes. He said, by chance, are you here in town? And I said, yeah, uh, how can I help you? He said, we have a situation. Um, Shil was supposed to play with her dad, Pete, but Prince called her on a last minute show. Right. She can't play. And we inquired all over town who could fill the slot and your name came up. And, um, we um, researched your number um, through other musicians and they gave us your number and we want to know if you're available to play tonight. <laughs> wow. With Pete Escovito. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And my brother's looking at me like, you know, we just ordered like over $40 worth of pizza, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's not that much pizza, but you got to turn it down when Pete comes calling and all that. You know? I did find just a matter of time, so I'm going to put that on speaking of that. And y'all got a chance to play with them. So I did find that video, but I also want to let folks check out some of the other shows that we have here on the uh, network, including one that yeah. deals with disabilities and other things along that line. So I'm going to put those on and then we'll come back with the video as well. But it's definitely having an enjoyable conversation with Dr. Funk. He's always got some amazing things to talk about, his love of music and all of that. This is the other show that I do. So if folks are not usually catching uh, Monday afternoons at two o'clock and I had a lady from one of our major international film festivals, a documentary film festival that joined us at that time. So I had that particular person on earlier. So it was great having them on and all of that. So uh, Deidre Hodge runs the Full Frame Film Festival and I was glad to have her on. But you know, we do a number of other shows as well. One of them deals with chess. So I'm gonna let you check out about Chess Stars as well as talking upstream and then win with win which is dealing with disability so these are some of the other shows that air right here on the network and then we'll come back with the music and i see that you know uh dr funk is represented by uh eris and others and i see that another one of eris's clients who is gonna join us in conversation is here in the house as well so we'll bring up king wojack very shortly but first let's check out what well, actually king wojack looks like he might have disappeared but hopefully he'll come back but right now let's check out chess stars and also check out about the music and all of that so right now let's check out about chess stars and then i'll come back and ask dr funk if he even knows about the game of chess and whether he plays it <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, that show actually debuted earlier today. That was uh, Win Charles' show, Win with Win. And as you can tell, she's definitely uh, not letting a disability stop her from doing her work. She's actually a well-known podcaster and a former uh, educator and a number of other things. And she definitely uh, is still, uh, while dealing with cerebral palsy, still doing some amazing work and things of that nature. So she's not going to let something simple like a disability stop her from going about and accomplishing her various goals. And she's even had an amazing amount of downloads. I forget the exact figure, but it was some amount that I just dream of having. And I think she's trying to average like 400 a day or something along those lines. So she is definitely an inspiration to many and glad to see that she does that great work here on the network. So before we get to your music and before we get to King Wojak and we have some other people up here as well in the next hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes and all. But before we get to the video, I said I was going to tease you. So I was going to ask you, we do have a number of chess players here on the network, including one of the founders. Nick is an avid chess player. So do you play the game of chess or do you have some other games or video games that you are better at? So Dr. Funk, are you engaged in the world of chess? Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. I, I, I love chess. And um, a little secret for the fans, chess is my go-to when I have to travel overseas. Because you're on a plane for 14, 16 hours. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's on. You know, I get beat a lot because these guys are good. Right. You know? And I, you know, I'm learning more and more as I, as, I, as I go along because it's a very, very um, intellectual game. Right. That's why I love it. You know, because you, you gotta you gotta think. You know, and I, I remember uh, watching James Bond one of one of the James Bond 007 movies where they started out with these masters at this chess table. And um, just watching it and seeing how the professionals go about it was re very inspiring for me as far as playing chess, you know? And I saw the guy in your advertisement, um, Sasha. Yes, yeah, Sasha Star, right. Oh, okay. That's interesting, I like that. Yep, and he's actually done a uh, number of shows here on IBM.TV. He is also, which I know a lot of folks also find this very important in the world of music, he is a, a investment coach and an investment person. So he is definitely all about investing in one of his other shows that I might put on that spot about as well later on is uh, Sasha talking about the importance of investing. So I'm thinking that as a musician and getting some of those contracts and everything that when you get that money, you try to find ways to invest it both into the community as well as into your personal economy as well. Am I correct I'm in thinking need, um, that? I'm gonna need to talk to Sasha because we need some investments. Okay. Oh, that's, yeah. that's real. Yeah. You know, because yeah, they, people invest in us so we can invest in others. Right. You know, it's kind of like Robin Hood, you know, steal from the rich, give to the poor. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. That makes a lot of sense. So we're going to try to, put, we're gonna we're try to put up your music. And I will definitely have uh, you know. Sasha uh, or me get in touch with you about trying to see about that happening and all yeah. of that. But I do want the folks to check out this other video as well. And then we're going to come back with King Wojak and continue our conversation about music and its importance. So definitely folks can stick around and join. But right now, let's check out Just a Matter of Time. All right. That's not the right one. 
Oh, is that the right one? No. Well, we'll go with this one. Boy. That's just the song they put up. We can't find the other one, but this is one of your other songs that's along that same line, but they just put up the wrong one, and that's what happens in the world of the internet sometimes. No, it's the, it's the right song, but it's not the video. Gotcha. We'll see if we can't find that other video that you're talking about, but that definitely gave them a taste of what the music was all about, featuring Pete Escovito and all of that. And we've also got another member of Eris's team as well, that Ubo Magazine crew. So glad to see King Wojak in the house and all of that. So how are you doing, King Wojak? How's it going? I see that you're over there representing the West Coast also. So you're in another part of the West Coast. I know that uh, Dr. Funk is in... Uh, the uh, California area, and if I remember correctly, you are in either Washington or in Oregon. Which one is it? King Wojak, can't hear you. You got a you're on mute or whatever, so we can't hear you right now. So hopefully we'll be able to get him going. So can okay, still don't hear him. It's like silent language. We're doing like sign language. So hopefully we'll get him going and all of that because i'm not hearing him at all but uh definitely while we get that situated because i'm not hearing what king wojack has got to say so he might have to bounce off and bounce back in because we're not hearing him at all so uh hopefully we'll get him going and he can come back in and all of that so uh if he gets a chance i uh, uh, sent you the link to just Matter of time video okay cool you did send me that link on the uh chat you said that in private chat, uh, um, Dr. Funk? I sent it to your email. Okay. Well, we will pull that and we will get the right one. I appreciate that. So we will pull that right one so we can get that up and everything while we're waiting to see what's going on with uh, King Wojak as well. We do want folks to 
hear everything. So we will have that going on. They don't hear y'all at all. We don't hear you at all. Like I said, we're I not hearing it. So they might have to bounce out and bounce back in because we're not hearing them at all. So hopefully they will bounce back out and then come back in because I see them, but I did not hear them. And so neither did Dr. Funk because Dr. Funk was going like, I don't understand sign language either. So hopefully they'll come back in and we'll see what they've got to say, but we'll pull up the email and all of that. So definitely that will go on and all of that along those lines. And while we're waiting to do that, I also have to do something else as well, just because I promised them some promotions also. So, you know, we're always trying to get different folks doing different things because that's just the kind of folks that we are and the kind of ways that we represent the world. So, you know, later on in another week or two, we're going to have the pleasure of having some folks that are connected with the um, Chinese Lantern Festivals that travel around the country. So they sent a video oh. and they've actually been here before in Cary. So they know they travel around, but here is a promotional video about their stuff. So did want folks to see what they're all about. I actually went to one of these here in North Carolina not that long ago. And I can tell you that it is just like this. The pictures are amazing. And you see some amazing artwork and there's amazing performances, but they will be coming on the show in the very near future, one of our mini podcasts, talking about this great artwork that they do and just their show in general. So looking forward to having them as one of our guests. And this is just some of the shows that they do. I believe this was one of their shows in Paris, Paris, France, of course. But as you can tell, the uh, ways that this artwork is done is truly amazing. Like I said, I saw the pleasure of going to one of these in Cary, North Carolina. And it's just like it looks. It's just truly amazing. And I'm hoping to go back later on. Uh, I think I went earlier this year before the uh, pandemic hit. And I do hope to go back next year as well. So definitely, I don't know if you've ever been to one of those, but it is truly amazing. Have you ever had a chance of going to one of those at all at any time, Dr. Funk? Because if you haven't, you should make it a point to try to attend one because it's just something that is always wonderful. So have you ever been to one of those? No, I haven't. I like to see it. Yeah. I looked amazing. Yeah, it is truly great. Like I said, some of the people that are organizing with that will be appearing on our show uh, very shortly, I think in another week or two. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with them about how they got involved and what they're all about. But yeah, I agree with you. The first time I saw it, I was just truly amazed. I was sitting there going like, I just cannot believe this. A friend of mine, I knew about it for years because they've been doing it for a number of years here in this area. So I did know about it, but okay. I had never had the pleasure of actually going to it until more recently. So like I said, like you, I was truly amazed. And I see the video and I've got the video, so I'm going to bring that up as well. And like I said, it was just truly fantastic. And I see that you were sitting there once again, sitting down, sitting and enjoying that sit down moment. But this time, was that the great Dr. Uh, or Mr. Escobedo that you were sitting there conversating with? Because we're here pull up the picture, but that looked like that was, uh, was that Pete that was the uh, other actor? That's Pops. Pops, I mean. Pops and uh, Pete Escovito are having a conversation. So it's Pops meet Pops. All right. And I play Pops. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, just like in the first video, you know, I play Pops and I'm talking to myself. So in this one, Pops is talking to Pops, because everybody in the industry called Pete Escarito Pops. Right. So, and actually, Pete Escarito, he said he really enjoyed that because um, he thought it was very nostalgic how I can um, turn into Pops, the old, the old guy. Right. You know. So, Pete had he had a lot of fun doing the video. <laughs> we had a good time. Sounds like it. Well, we're looking forward to it, and let's check this out and see what this is all about. So uh, yeah. definitely folks can learn about this and see what y'all are doing, but it was just truly fun when I went there. Hey, buddy. How's it going, hey, man? Bro. Great to see you, man. How you doing? Yeah. I'm still getting around. Yeah, yeah, you're doing good. Hey, man. Hey, man. Who's that playing, man? You said it was great. Oh, those are my boys, man. They're my little boys. Mind, body, and soul. Oh, they sound great. Yeah, they're getting like these, man. <laughs> they're going to be out there. Yeah. Uh, 
Let's go check it out, man. Let's go do it. Did you see you guys going to heart Yeah. Yeah, we might get out there and check out my body and show. Oh, sweet. Can I go in? Yeah, everybody. All right. Let's go. Let's all go.
So tell us again about uh, what it was like working with uh, Pete Escovito. Like I said, I know a number of folks are probably in the video and realizing that, that was the legendary Pete Escovito that you worked with and all of that. So I'm sure a number of folks would love to know more about that story and uh, just what it was like and what lessons you might have learned from him as a uh, fan of the music. Because like I said, I know that he is a truly legendary musician. So just tell folks uh, any lessons that you might have learned from working with uh, Mr. Escovito as a musician. Uh, I I don't know where to start. I, I learned so much from Pops, um, Pete Escovito. When I, when I was a kid, I used to try to imitate him by listening to his records when he was with Tito Puentes. Mm -hmm. And um, he taught me so much as far as playing that percussion, timbales. And um, we met. And like I was telling you earlier, and I had to go do the show with him. And he told me if I ever needed him to give him a call, you know, and people say that in the industry, right. you know, but I called him and I said, I said, Pops, well, I, I have a new song that we're going to do. It's kind of reggae. Hello. Latin. Hey, what's up, King? Dr. Dr. Funk. Yo, what's happening? Can you hear me, brother? We can we hear, you. hear you. We hear you loud and clear. Sorry to interrupt. I had to get That's some right. headphones and get my iPhone products together. And uh, I'm hey, I'm you got to do it. it you got to do it. I'm listening. You're got good. my stage burning. I'm ready. Cool. You so, so let me get the story, and then I'm gonna find out how y'all both connected with Eris. But I want to hear the finish of the story with Pete, and then I'll find out of how y'all connected with Eris and. Ubo magazine and what she's all about, and then, but I want to hear the story that you were talking about with uh, Pete and that Pete. lesson that you learned. Yeah, so I called him. And I said, "Hey, you know, we got this tune. It's going to be reggae, Latin, and funk together." And um, and I said, "You know, you told me to call you." So I and I asked him. I said, "Will you be able to be on the record?" And you know what that man said? He said, "Yes." He said, me and mama will come down, you know, his wife. And he said, take care of us. And that's all I ask. And we'll go in and we'll lay these tracks. And we did. And it was an amazing experience seeing Pop's work, you know, because he played kungas and he played tambales. And he had me set up my tambales. The ones you see in the video, those are my tambales. And he said, play. So I had to actually play in front of Pops. Wow. I mean, you got to be tight, oh, yeah. you know, because he's a legend. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we laid the tracks. And then a few months later, I said, do you want to be in the video? He said, yeah, that'd be fun. You know, and it came down and we shot the video. We had a good time. We was just laughing the whole day, you know, and that's a trooper because, you know, when you're shooting a video, it takes a while, you know, you got to do every scene, you know, and, and I kept, I said, dad, you okay? You doing good? He said, oh man, this is great. <laughs> he, he was having a good time, you know? And the song is about just a matter of time is about, it's just a matter of time people come together. Mm. That's what that song is about. That's why you saw all different nationalities in that movie, in that, in that video because I want to show the world that we all need to stand together. This racism needs to stop. We need yeah. to put a halt on that crap. And that's for real. Yeah, that makes and a lot of sense. Like, and I know King Ojak talks about that as well and his attitudes. I've had the pleasure of talking to you right. before about racism and what's going on in the world and everything. So I'd love to hear you interject your thoughts on uh, what's happening in the world and the need for unity and things of that nature. So definitely, I'd love to hear what you've got to say about that, King Wojak. I don't know if he can hear us or not. Yeah, well, he Who, was me? speaking to us. Yeah, yeah, all you, King Wojak. Y'all was cutting out for a minute. It, cut out, it cuts in, it cuts out. The last part I heard is about the racism needs to stop. Right, and I was asking your thoughts about that. And, and now we're cut out saying. again. All right. I was asking, what do you think about uh, 
the whole nature of uh, what's going on in the industry and also what's going on in the world. So can you hear me on that? And if so, your comments on the racism in the world. Hello? He's having issues. So like I said, um, have no. technical. let's see if this works. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me better now? Dr. Mark D. Yes, Dr. speaking. Funk. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you now. Uh, All right. Cool. That's yeah, one in and out. That... I'm not sure how it's going to go. I'm just trying to hear your guys' conversation so I don't come in talking about uh, fertilizer. <laughs> Understood. No, I was asking you about the conversation. In and out. Gotcha. So I'm going to see about uh, what we can got going on there and see if we can't get it going better. But one of the things we were talking about was just about the nature of um, – what's going on in the world. And I agree with you. We've got to find ways to be more unified and all of that. So yeah. definitely that's what we're talking about. And I agree with you that we need more unity. One of the other things that I was going to ask you really quickly was about the cars. Cause my brother is actually a member of a group called the slingshot club, which is those, I call them the Batmobile cars, but it's those slingshots and uh, things of that nature, the Polaris slingshot, and you had those old antique cars. So, how did you go about getting that cars? And is that something that you're a big <laughs> fan of? Is old cars? Because, like I said, the uh, slingshot is more of a um, kind of a sports car. I mean, it's a, a actually a gas saving sports car, as I just recently learned. But uh, I consider it a sports car. But definitely, those cars that you had were classic. So. Was that something you always wanted in the video? Is that something that you're a big fan of, which is classic automobiles? Both. I've always wanted to do a video with serious muscle cars. And I am um, a big fan. And my family up in Seattle, where King Wojak is, uh, we build muscle cars. Okay. And... um. I have myself, I have a 72 Charger. It wasn't in the video because it's not done yet. Okay. But um, we, um, yeah, my, my family up there, we built muscle cars. And my godfather, my godfather was big in the whole um, drag world back in the day when drag, strip, drag racing was like big, huge. And uh, he helped design a lot of cars. So, by a blessing, I met a lot of the people that you saw with the the uh, classic muscle cars that were in the video. We played a car show, and we did a concert for the people at the car show, and we all became good friends. So when the director said, "Dr. Funk, how do you want to approach this video?" I said, I think I have an idea. Mm -hmm. And I want to have really cool classic cars leading out of the city, going to somewhere that is really beautiful. And then we have the band out there, have people and, you know. And so we started calling up some of the people from the car show and they said, Dr. Funk, anything for you. You know, you just tell us how many you want and where you want us and we'll make it happen. I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah. So you, you actually saw two car clubs that joined together. Oh, wow. And um, they donated their time in the cars. And we figured out a way on how to film everything nice. And by bonus, we got to ride in those cars. <laughs> it was just so <laughs> cool, man. You know? And um, and you know, had a wonderful time because he loved cars too. So we had an excellent time. <laughs> and for those that are watching, um, tell folks how y'all connected. I'm gonna see if we can this time. Hopefully, it'll work. Get um, Simo Jack involved. But how did you connect with Eris and the whole Ubo Magazine family and everything? Because, like I said, I know both of y'all are part of that family. So, how did you manage to connect and with uh, Eris and the whole? Uh, things that she's doing in terms of promoting music and being a promoter and things of that nature. Because that's how I met both of y'all as well as a few other folks. So I'd love to know the story of how y'all connected. Well, um, we actually met online and I was doing my normal as far as, you know, promoting mind, body, and soul. You know, you got to 
do the business side and the promotion and marketing. And then I saw a, a link came up about um, Ubo uh, magazine. And so I got in touch with her and I said, hey, I'm looking for somebody to help me because we are getting so busy. My time is get, getting chopped, you know. And she said, oh, Dr. Funk, I'd love to help you. And I said, I said, you know, we're, we're that type of act that, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on. So it's going to be, you know, nonstop. And it's been a lot of fun working with her. We, we have a lot of stuff in common as far as marketing and business. So we work together really good. And through her, I got the pleasure of meeting you, which is awesome. Thank you. Thank you know, you. This is really cool. Thank you. Really good. And uh, King yeah. Bojack, if you can hear me and everything, how did you go about meeting uh, Eris and the Ubo Magazine family as well? And if you had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Funk in person yet, I know that he said that he's got family in Seattle, but have y'all had the pleasure of meeting yet? Not yet. I have, no. I have not had the pleasure to meeting Dr. Funk. This is our first acquaintance. Uh, salute to my uh, label mate as far as UBO Magazine. Uh, I met her the same exact way, just grinding online. Facebook, I had 3,500 friends. Uh, Instagram, I had 1,500. Um, I only got like, you know, a few followers on my YouTube because I just, I, I, I'm not, you know, versed in trying to, you know, build my YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, I met her the same way. We correspond on the phone, uh, made a few payments, uh, told her what my budget was like. And she said, I can work with you because I like your product. And, you know, first of all, for when you work with people in the industry, you know, some people want to work with you because you're shelling out money. Other people want to work with you because they like your product. They like what you stand for. They like their, your movement. And sometimes it, they don't really need your money, although she does. We all need money. But they want to be a part of something that's much bigger than money. And so that's how I feel like, you know, we connected. And, um, you know, I've been I've been needing the help uh, along the ways from her and Mr. Mark Lee and whoever else I can get during this COVID because, you know, everything is shut down. And and of course, what do we do, you know, with our talents at, at, in this time? Yep. And that's one of the things that me and Dr. Funk were talking about is he's actually recording right now. And I was wondering, are you recording as well right now? Or you got any new projects? And what are you doing in order to survive? Like I said, Dr. Funk said he's been in the studios now he's been able to get some of his folks in that environment and of course trying to do it in the correct way and all but what about yourself king wojack what are you doing in terms of trying to be involved in music with all this going on you're also like you said in seattle i know that that's been like a hot area along with portland and other places in the black lives matter movement so definitely i'm thinking that you've probably seen a lot of that going on as well so how are you staying engaged both as an activist because that's considered uh, Mr. Wojak to also be an activist. So how are you staying engaged in that? And also how are you staying engaged in your music work? Uh, to be quite honest, and always when I speak, I must be honest. Uh, music has been on the back burner for me. I've been struggling to reach a, you know, a plateau of writing outside the box because everything I seem to write before this shit started going down with Donald Trump and the, po the whole political... Um, crap of COVID and stuff, I was already into, you know, writing about political stuff and, and, and writing about the president and the government and new world order and racism. And so, you know, what do I write about now? It's almost like I don't need to write anything because my whole catalog consists of, you know, information about this, 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 this time that we're in. So be honest with you, I'm, I'm helping my, my wife who's, you know, just had her 11th surgery in her ankle and she's trying to get well and so I've become a caregiver somewhat into this household and um, just trying to make sure I stay sane myself in this COVID thing because we got to stay at home. You know, we got to wear masks everywhere we go. We know that there's going to be a new resurgence in, in the virus, as you see with the Donald Trump getting it and, and, you know, the higher ups getting it. We just have to stay focused about, you know, not trying to follow into the same routines of going to the grocery stores and going out to kick it and going to look for something to do because we're bored around where I'm staying at. 
We've got mm-hmm. nothing but white supremacy all around us. So I don't really go out too much because, you know, you've got the Proud Boys who are now in the spotlight thanks to Donald Trump. These guys are from Washington State. They've never had the major national spotlight like this before until Donald Trump and the government mentioned their name. And now they're all from Vancouver, outside of Seattle, Portland. Um, they're all around us. And that's where I feel like I'm in their, you know, in their camp. So for me, I know the surroundings of where I live at. I'm not going out to kick it and hang out at night. You know, there's gunshots, there's shootings going on all around here. I mean, there's weird things going on at night that I see. And so music is the last thing. But I have been writing. I have been writing. I can't lie about that. I have been writing. Outside yeah, it seems box. like there's Songs, a lot of stuff poetry. to write about and all of that. Because like you just said, I couldn't believe it. We were talking about that before you got on. When um, Mr. Trump said that whole thing about uh, stand down and stand by or whatever that exact quote was. And I'm sitting there going like, I can't believe you're telling your folks to stand by. And that was actually directed apparently to the Proud Boys and some of those other kinds of organizations. And then like we were talking about before you got on, um, apparently, because uh, everything that I had always heard was it's supposed to take 14 days but apparently he's worked some magic because he's out meaning the person in 1600 in about three or four days. So when you heard that he was getting out today, what were some of your thoughts on that? Because me and uh, Dr. Funk were talking about that. And like I said, he agreed with me that I've always heard that it's supposed to be 14 days, but apparently Friday to Monday doesn't equal 14 days in anybody's calendar. Here's the deal, Mr. Mr. Lee and Dr. Funk, since you guys are, uh, uh, you know, well-versed about this. I can only tell you my theory, and, and, and the theory is Donald Trump is in trouble either way. Because if he gets in and out with COVID in four or five days and 220,000 people have died and they don't have the same, he's going to lose either way. He can't win. He's, but, but we don't know what they're giving him, and there might be experimenting on him. And remember, Mr. Lee, if you, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys follow The Simpsons, I believe that they have been telling the truth for a long time, and they are the ones who predicted Donald Trump would be laying in the casket as well as him being president as well as all types of other things. And so we don't know what's going to happen to Mr. President. I pray for him uh, you know, because like I said, there's a lot of people out here in our circles that are happy that Donald Trump has got COVID-19 and they're they're wishing the worst upon him. But you can't do that. You can't stoop to the lo- level of your enemies and wish death upon them because death shall come upon you as well. You reap what yeah. you sow. And so I don't want to wish him any ill harm. He's reaped what he sowed. This is karma coming back to get Donald Trump. And if he does truly have it, or if it's just a political stunt to say, listen, look, you guys go get the vaccine because I got the vaccine and it works. Boom. Now everybody's lining up for the vaccine. It could be a political stunt. I don't trust nothing the White House is doing, nothing Donald Trump is saying. They're all, they've are they been lying and they, they're, they're not credible in anything they say and do from here on out. So yeah, that what do you want me to do? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And one of the other things that I want to get back to is some of the other things that we and Dr. Funk were talking about and just getting off of a little bit of the political front. We were talking about both uh, muscle cars as well as the pleasure of working with celebrities. So I was wondering, King Wojak, if you had that pleasure, because uh, definitely um, Dr. Funk mentioned that he worked with Pete Escovito and he also worked with a number of other celebrities. So I was wondering, in your musical career, if you could talk about some of the folks that, if I remember correctly, you worked with some of the like main acts around the rap world as every and everything. So what was that like working in that field? And are you still in touch with those people? I am not in touch. I, I was really good friends with DJ Quick when his first album came out. We ran into him in L.A., became good friends, spent weeks down there just hanging out in his studio with uh, AMG, uh, KK, and all the rest of the crew. Um, so mix a has been one of my great close mentors, but because it's a competition thing here in Washington State, we don't keep in contact because I am feared as, not feared, but just regarded as a radical artist. And, you know, of course, when you've got the establishment working with you, they don't want nothing to do with anything radical. And so... Um, I, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of working with several folks, but, you know, artists are weird, you know, to me and my, my, my weirdness, artists are all weird and we all just have to gel and blend and work together. And in these times it's become more harder because now people are really demanding that their craft be paid for and their, and their time and services be paid for. And so it's hard to get a great producer because he wants all the money for all his beats. It's hard to get some people to come in and just build on a 
project because they all want to be compensated before the, the project can even be born, you know? So we don't have the budgets like that. And I feel you, uh, Dr. Funk, we all need uh, uh, some, some investors. We all need some investment into our craft, not just somebody coming in saying, here's some money, do this, what I do, what I want you to do with my money. Somebody that says, Hey, I believe in your craft. I believe in your ability to manage your money as far as going to build a, a, a solid project and yeah. let us go to work because it costs money to sit in a million dollar studio or, or just even a home studio. And you want the greatest sound that you can get. So you have to get, you have to pay for what you, you know, want. And it's just, it's so difficult right now. And people are making great albums out of their closets and out of their homes and stuff. So I, I guess I'm just, a, you know, I, I'm an old school guy. I just want the old ways. I want to have a, a small budget to not worry about paying for the studio, not worry about eating gas to the studio. And let me go in here and zone out as an artist. Because when I do zone out, you'll get the project. If I got to focus on home, uh, focus on what I got to eat, focus on COVID, focus on wearing a mask. I got to focus on, on eat, uh, diabetes. I got to focus on this and that. I, how can I give you a great project? It's too difficult for me. I'm, I'm, I got too much around. So, I, so it's hard at a 50-year-old to focus out. Young kids, they can zone out, do some drugs, and go into a closet and come up with a great album, uh, according to them. For us, we got life to live. We got things to do around here. And so music is not the uh, end, of, uh, you know, our, our go-to anymore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'd love to hear from both of you because one of the things we're seeing is a number of artists that are using their platforms and a number of athletes that are using their platforms to talk about things, whether it's COVID, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's their own personal economy. So I'll turn to you, Dr. Funk, and then come back to King Wojak. But how important do you think it is for our artists and our um, entertainers to use their platforms in order to spread the message, whether that's a message of love or a message of concern. It's very important, very important because as artists, people are looking up at us and they look at us for a lot of different um, support. They look at us for positive support, music, a way to escape, you know, the normal daily grind like like King was talking about, you know, I got to worry about rent, food, you know, all this stuff. So people need to escape. That's why it's very important. Like, um, I love what Ice Cube is doing by talking to people and letting them know, hey, you need to go vote. You need to stop this crap. You know, because it's important. It's important for us as artists to get to those people that, you know, don't have an outlet, you know, it's important for us to show support to everybody because in the urban community, you have a lot of people that don't have the luxury of being able to do just normal things. You know, they have to worry about being on the system, getting welfare, you know, trying to take care of the kids, you know, and some of these people can't afford for the kids to go to school. You know, so it's our job to show them support and give them the support that they deserve because it's it's hard on everybody, you know. And I was serious when I said, yeah, we're looking for investors because I'm going to start a nonprofit organization called Music and Art Forever mm. because I like mixing music with art. And um, I want to start an organization so we can help get music and art programs back into public schools because they've taken it out. All they concentrate on is sports. I'm like, well, that's kind of unfair because every kid is not an athlete. You know, you got kids that can paint. You know, there's different time type of art. There's art for, you know, painting or there's digital design, you know, it's all art. And then you have kids like I was that can play music and they want to do music. Either they want to play instrument or they want to sing, they want to rap or they want to dance. You know, they're autistic, you know. When I was a kid, they called us child prodigies because I was in 
preschool and I could play. I was just a little kid in preschool. And they put on those little uh, nursery rhymes right. on that little old record player. And I was able to play all those melodies. So they called my mom and they said, your son is special. So they were trying to figure out how I knew how to do this. It all came from here. Yeah. yeah. From my heart, because I could listen to something and play it on those little flutophones that they give you, you know, as kids. So they actually called my mom down there and they said, you need to put him in a special um, musical program because it's amazing that he can play it at such a young age. But, you know, Growing up in the hood, my mom didn't have no money for that, you know? And I never met my dad, so it wasn't happening. Gotcha. So I just took on upon myself, whatever was going on with music, I was there. Sounds you know? great. What about you, King Wo Jack? Were you involved also um, in the arts as a young kid? And do you think that there's a importance that we need to have with more arts in the public school system and also how important do you think it is for our artists to be active so actually um dr funk brought up the thing about arts in schools so i'd love to hear your thoughts on that but also the original question was about art and athletes as activists uh yes um so i was uh artistically talented my parents bought me a drum set at six years old. I tapped on them drums until 10. I was playing in the church by 11. Um, just holding down, you know, the drums and stuff. And then from there, I just got into sports and football, basketball, boxing. Uh, boxing was my favorite sport. So from there, I um, tried to pursue a little boxing career. And then I went in straight directly into music. I just dropped boxing, went into music. Uh, I remember school, and they didn't have too many, you know, I, nothing that I wanted to do. So, Dr. Funk, I, I commend you on that vision because I just also had the vision. We have to be around the same age. I'm, I'm 50 years old, Mr. Funk. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other day I was driving down the street and we have this huge lot that is uh, open in the Indian. I think the Indian uh, Puyallup Indian Nation owns it. Big old lot. And so the Lord has sent a vision to me of a school for the arts, for music, for entertainment, for basketball, for, you know, exercise, for, you know, just a giant center that kids can come to, the grown adults can record, you know, a, a recording facility. Uh, we teach people also the other end of the music industry, which is promotion, production, and, and, and marketing and stuff like that. This vision came to me so clear. And I was like, who would I go to to execute this vision and, and maintain hold it because once you give them the vision, they take it and run with it and cut you out of it. And you know what I mean? And it's such a blessing to even think that you could provide something for the community uh, of this stature. So in my world, if, if Mark Womack was president, this these things would be around the country and they would be developing young artists and young, you know, athlete, young athletes and um, very talented speakers and and uh, debaters and people that were just all about the arts. And this is, you know, this is what runs the country, man. The arts run the country. You listen to the commercials today, they're, they're biting our little uh, old hip hop uh, uh, songs from back in the day. And, and yeah. uh, you know, they're just, they're biting all the yeah. hip hop but putting their little white spin to it. You know what I mean? And so hip hop's never going away. And in the future, we're just, it's gonna be something big if we can maintain some sort of democracy that works for everybody and not just white America. No, I agree with you on that and everything. And you talk about it like the need to have some debate coaches and things of that nature. Uh, you know, if a certain person in 1600 had had that course, he might not have been so, having such a, of a clown performance at his latest debate because he definitely needed some debate coaching because that debate was real sorry. Uh, Dr. Funk said he had the pleasure of not catching it. What did, did you catch it, uh, King Mo Jack? And what was your assessment of his performance. Hey, do, uh, uh, does anybody remember Clockwork Orange? Yes, I do remember the movie Clockwork Orange. You remember when they had the people's eyes open and sat there and made them watch all that horrible stuff? Yep. That's that's how we felt. Me, my wife, my mother-in-law, <laughs> yeah. we sat there yeah. and watched this horrible... And, and you know what? I knew Donald Trump was going to come out and be Donald Trump, but 
before the whole debate started, I said to myself, I wish, I said, this is on national grand scale. So whatever these guys do tonight is going to be, you know, I set the precedent for America. And for, so I said, I wish uh, Joe Biden would come out and slap the shit out of Donald Trump physically right there on, on the screen, just in front of America, in front of the world. That would just set the tone of, listen, cut your lying, bro. Cut the shit out. But that's too extreme. That's MMA style. But Donald Trump came out with the same style, talking cra crazy, cutting them off, you know, and it just became a, a shit show. And if I was, you know, on his team, if I was, you know, if I held my ass tight enough to be a Republican or a Democrat, I would say, Mr. Trump, Go out there and let Joe Biden bury himself. Ask him about Epstein Island. Was he on that call list for going to Epstein? You know what I mean? Certain questions that would have destroyed him right there. And just be cool because what, what, what Donald Trump was not that day, he was not cool at all. And he even turned off white people. White people looked at him like, oh, my God, this is, this is, uh, we don't want to vote for this. This is crazy. Nobody wants to vote for some type of weird guy that doesn't respect rules. What? He didn't That's respect true. rules. Yeah, he does not expect respect rules at all. And then I was just amazed that he came out and said what he said about the taxes and the fact that he got away with the taxes. And he, like uh, one of my cohorts here on the network said, he basically told folks right then and there that I don't have to play by the same rules that y'all play by. And he told the folks there directly in the debate that. So that's one of those moments that I was sitting there going shocked that he would even be bold enough to say something like that. But then again, I also remember him from The Apprentice and a number of other things where he does say some very bold things that you're sitting there just shaking your head. Crazy, bro. That's that's not presidential. That's not professional. That's not respectful. That's not cool to talk about somebody's family. So if Joe Biden would have went over and slapped this shit out of him, I would have been all for Joe Biden all the way, 100 percent, no matter where he what island he'd been to. But that's just in my world if me and mike tyson were president and vice president it'd be some action going down in white house in in in, in, in washington because we're not going to take all these lying and pedophiles and all this stuff because that's what they really need is some real you know you, you kids can't go stoop to that level but you sometimes you feel like you have to because that's who they are behind the scenes there's they're hiring hitmen and killing off people and, and they got so many secrets and so much demonic crap going on i just can't trust that our country is going down the right path today in America. And no, it's you got a point. And I'd love to hear from both of y'all what y'all's thoughts are about how the world views America, because I know that we are a global network here on the uh, IBM.TV network, and we've got folks that even do a travel show, and we've got folks from Australia, South Africa, Malaysia, and a number of other places. But and I know that both of you are in areas where you get to meet people from different cultures. So what is the view that you're hearing from your friends that are of different cultures, be that Latin America, be that Asian cultures or different other cultures? Because I know that there is a decent Asian community in the Washington area and in the California area. So what are you hearing from your friends that are of different nationalities? So I'll go to you, King Wo Jack, and I'll come to Dr. Funk. But what are you hearing from your uh, global community? I ain't got no friends. <laughs> so I'm by myself, okay? Me, myself, and God, and my wife and, and family. Uh, but, what, you know, I go out and shop, and it's just, man, you know, nobody's talking really, bro. I mean, to be honest with you, we're not communicating. I just deleted my social media account, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and, uh, and Twitter, because I felt that this, this documentary that we watched called uh, The Social Dilemma, I don't know what happened to King Wojak. Hopefully he'll come back, but he was going to tell us about that documentary. What are your thoughts on that? Um, and hopefully, like I said, we'll get uh, King Wojak back. He cut off on us there for a minute, but he was definitely spitting some fire and all of that. But what are your thoughts about the way the, glo the globe and the world treats us? Well, my, my thoughts on it, and, you know, I don't have friends. I have family all over the world. I have family all over the world. And that's what makes this world go around. And I talk to my family, whether they in Europe, Canada, Japan, my bad, China, you know, because we we all on the same level. You know, because I've played all over the world. There's still some places I want to go. But like my family that's in Europe, London, Italy, France, they 
they tell him, they said, Dr. Funk, is there any way you can move over to Europe? Mm. Because you seem out of place. Because your president ain't right. Ain't right. Do you know that our president now, when he first got in office, he tried to steal people music. Mm -hmm. He tried to take ACDC music. He tried to take Earth, Wind & Fire music and so many other big artists. And they said no. And he had a tantrum in the White House. <laughs> he said, I'm the president. I can do what I want. Congress had to tell him, no, you can't steal these people's music. You're the president, but you don't own the right to these people's music. Mm -hmm. You know, and he turned into a child. So what did what what did he try to do? He tried to shut stuff down. That ain't right. He don't have to turn, Doc. He don't have to turn, Doc. He's you a can't child. You the people music, you get mad. You know what I'm saying? That ain't right. He's supposed to be the president. You know, this yeah. ain't right. It ain't cracking because you're showing people how to be kids, yes. how adults are kids. That's why you got all these organizations coming out of the woodwork talking about white supremacy. You didn't hear about them a few years ago. Mm -mm. They were just sitting back faking. Now, because the president says it's okay, you got people driving down the street. The other day, about three weeks ago, I was at the red light. These guys pulled up in the truck. They sporting the flag, flipping me off, calling me nigger. Mm. Mm. And I looked at them like, you really don't want me to get out of this car. Seriously. I ain't from here. I'm from New York City, and we don't play that crap. Y'all out here in California going buck wild. I can show you how we do it on the East Coast. I know that's right. Um, King Roger, you got cut off before and you were talking about um, you were making a comparison, not the Clockwork Orange, but there was another documentary that you had mentioned. And unfortunately, that's when uh, the phone went out. So if you would My share a little bit about that documentary and uh, why that's got you off of social media. So uh, I heard, you know, we during this pandemic, we're watching Netflix and this uh, documentary pops up and I heard it on Facebook a few times that people were watching it and thinking about deleting their social medias. So it was called The Social Dilemma. Yeah, it's a great documentary, a bunch of scientists, people from Google, people from all in the tech industry saying how they are just, they're turning, they're telling their side of the story on why they got out of the tech industry and why they believe that it's crooked and criminal and selling America's rights and properties to different countries and stuff. And so I was always struggling with just wasting time on Facebook and waking up every morning. I would spend at least an hour in the bed scrolling through social media. And what would turn me off about the social media is that Facebook would allow fight videos, black and black fight videos, uh, white people fighting black people in the stores, uh, just nothing but ignorance, you know, fight uh, police killing blacks in the middle of the street. These videos were allowed to be seen on Facebook. But if you said anything about, uh, uh, white people or anything about the uh, the establishment, the way Facebook or somebody reported you, you would get kicked off Facebook. So the amount of hours that I was spending on Facebook, the time, of, the amount of money I was getting off of Facebook wasn't enough for me to say, you know what, this is it's enough. I need to, you know, delete my Facebook social media account, stop this addiction, stop wasting my time on this uh, on this basic uh, inquirer it's basically like the inquirer of social media and everything is fake false and phony and everybody's front and i just said let me give it a break let me get max just let me delete everything and i feel so much better to this day because i don't devote three to four hours a day checking social media sitting down on my uh, couch and 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 um, seeing who said this and posting my my opinions and giving people free music, basically posting my videos and, and all my projects on there for free. They don't have to go buy shit from Wojak because it's all on Facebook. It's all on Twitter. It's all on Instagram. They don't have to buy nothing from me. So I was wasting my time, and I'm glad to this day that I have quit that. Uh, Dr. Funk, the other day, I was driving down 56th Street in Tacoma, and there's a there's a, a Acura behind me and then a big white truck and the white boy truck 
comes all the way around. He speeds, you know, he goes around. This is a two-lane road. Whoa, traffic going this way, traffic going this way. He speeds around this Acura to get behind me and get all up on my ass. And then so I reach down in my car like I'm, you know what I mean, like I'm slowly going for something. And he pulls off all of a sudden. You know what I mean? So I'm not saying that I'm paranoid, but I know these white folks is up to no good right now. And, they, and they've been emboldened by their, by, you know, the, the stupidity of Donald Trump and white supremacy. And no matter who wins, white supremacy ain't going nowhere. It's still going to be here when Joe Biden wins or Donald Trump wins. And that's the problem we're going to have to deal with after this presidency thing is white, white supremacy is out the woodwork. They're ready. They're here. They got the guns and the weapons and they and they want the race war and they want the beef. And and we're just trying to live peacefully, do music, promote projects, have a good life, take care of our families. And these folks out here at target practice, you know, dreaming to kill niggas and, and, and wipe off Mexicans and gays and all types of man. This is sick. This is sick. And I just yeah. don't like to get too much into it, but that's my view and my opinion. It's just sickness out there. And I really wish I could fly to uh, Africa today and, and or fly to another country and start over and live fresh without, you know, worrying about leaving my family here and leaving, you know, anything that I have had that remotely built, you know? So I just, it's sad, but I wish, I know that an exodus is, is needed because we followed Bob Marley early on and, and movement of the people is what we need to return back to, so... We got to yeah, go somewhere. A lot of sense. Dr. Monk, um, King Wojak brought up an interesting point about social media and uh, how it can sometimes be a, uh, well, it can be a powerful tool in terms of publicity, but it can also be a negative. So where are you at in regards to social media and its uh, use and things of that nature? Because I do agree, and I'm on it all the time because of this platform and a number of other platforms, but it can sometimes become a negative factor as well. So what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Funk? I feel the same way, and um, I remember when Maurice White told him, he said, know what you put in your brain. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of what you put in your brain. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, a lot of, lot of people are like, well, Dr. Funk, you know, we don't, we don't see you on Facebook and, uh, and this and that. I said, I only promote business on Facebook. I don't sit on that thing all day because I learned back in the day, you're in charge with going in your brain. I'm not I'm not the type to sit on there, walk, walk, this, whoop, that, blah, blah, blah. No, it ain't happening. You know, if you love what I do, you know what I'm about. And I ain't got no time to be sitting on no Facebook, you know, or Tumblr or this and that. You know, because like like King said, they're controlling it. Mm-hmm. And they're controlling people. I see people sometimes like I might get a message that's important, you know. Like, you know, people might message me on Facebook because it's cheaper for them. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're messaging me from Japan or something. You know, it's cheaper than for them to call me. And they're like, hey, Dr. Front, you know, we heard you're single. Um, we want to use it in a club or whatever, you know. So I'll pop on, and I'd be like maybe eight or nine in the morning or whatever. And I'll get off. And then when I go back on to do my work, them same people are still on Facebook. I'm like, that's half your day. Uh -huh. Where your kids at? What have you done all day? You know? And then to get the, the people to actually run Facebook to actually tell you, they're in control. They are in control. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know what? You know, because I, I had told I had told my manager I was gonna shut everything down. He said, he said, Dr. Front, you can't do that. You have a business to run. I said, I understand that. I said, well, we're just gonna keep the business. You know? Yeah. And you know, the only other reason I might be on there is family. Right. Because I need to know how my family's doing, especially in these days, the times that's going on right now. You know, because these white boys are tripping. Call. You know? And 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 like King said, they ain't playing. They're not they playing, Sam. Shooting. They shooting people. Well, you know? They think they got the green light. President exactly. Trump gave them the green because light. Because of, of the president. 
Yes. Gene, we can start doing that. All of a sudden, oh, 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 black folks are killing everybody. Yeah, and this, they, they've been growing this in prison. <laughs> this is what they've been growing in prison. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it started in prison. And they wanted to do that. And it's called, <laughs> it's the old saying of divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's his strategy. That's his presidential that's strategy. Divide and it's been going on for a while because even when y'all talking about like the image of different folks with guns, I remember, and like I said, I've been in the East Coast uh, pretty much all my life, except for when I went to school in the Midwest. But I do remember uh, the age of the Black Panthers. I was only a kid in the 60s and the 70s, but they were also carrying guns, but they were painted as terrorists. But definitely, you know, these other folks are holding guns and don't have that same kind of image that our folks like the Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam and another of others that might have been carrying weapons or painted as and all of that. So it seems like a double standard exists. If you carry a gun and you one shade, then it's all right. If you carry a gun and you're another shade, not as all right. So like I said, I was wondering if that's what y'all have observed in y'all's uh, 50 plus years as well. Cause like I said, I'm in that same age range, 58 and all of that. So I was wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I agree because that Washington took a stand when Black Panthers took a stand and they had some lawyer come up with this, well, let's just call them terrorists so the world can look back at them. And these were good people. Mm -hmm. These were good people. And my uncle was down. He was down with them. You know? I was a baby. But he was down with them. And then when I got older, you know what? I took his, his advice. And I was with the Guardian Angels in the New York City. Mm -hmm. And we should patrol Central Park. Until somebody in New York started calling us terrorists. And we out there saving people. Because you had these weirdos running around raping women in Central Park. And we well, took it upon well. ourselves to protect them. But then well, you had... Now, yeah. One of my yeah, producers I actually just wanted to call us terrorists. Right. One of my producers actually brought up an interesting point and everything, and they were saying that, uh, and this is actually not somebody that's in the African American community, but they were saying, ever wonder why when Abe Lincoln claimed he was free and slaves, the laws that were written did not allow slaves to be equal or to earn equal pay, to own property or to vote, and why free people uh, to only indenture slave them. So she was uh, saying that she never liked Abe and felt that there was something uh, sneaky about him. He kept servants of whom made so little and why free people and not give them equal rights. So what are your thoughts on that quote that came from one of uh, my producers that's involved in this uh, platform that we're on? May I? Yes. I, I, I will say, to be honest with you, and you know, the real people know this, and and this is what they, I think they're afraid to say. But we all know that this system is not set up for us, no matter what day it started, when it started, when it happened, when it broke down, who fought who, uh, who you know. They realize that there is a commodity in humanity, in in the human beings that they were enslaving, and even if they a Lincoln fought to free us, they already knew we weren't going to be able to survive because we didn't even speak the language. We, we didn't have no connection. All we were going to be able to do is go back and work the land that we were taught to work in the first place. So they knew what they were going to do. And, and ever since the beginning, Democrats, Republicans, Republicans, Democrats, private parties, whatever, they're all against our, the free people of America. Because what, what this whole thing is about is slavery. It's about in, the, enslaving everybody and get, the rich get richer the, and everybody else just maintains a little bit. They throw us a little bit. So now that this democracy thing is about to be up because it's coming to an end and people are figuring out that this money ain't worth nothing, this presidency, is a, that all this democracy crap is, is a lie and they're, and they're just playing as they go and making the rules up as they go. People are going to get tired, tired and fed up. And this thing has to be like, like cancer. You know, when the doctors go into, and I subscribe to this theory all the time, when the doctor goes in to operate on cancer, you have to cut the cancer out. 
in order for the rest of the body to survive. So in order for humanity to, to survive, uh, the earth and the, the, the hell that's being put upon the earth because there's a cancer, the cancer has to be cut out. And when you address it like that, like the doctors address cancer, then you know that we have to have some physical clashing, some contact, some some black folks armed, standing up for themselves and saying enough is enough. And that's when everything goes to the race war, to goes to hell. And, and you know, it's, it's sad. I don't want to live this. I don't want to live in this country. And, and I don't want to stay here and fight for this place that, you know, it's very beautiful. But these folks are not going to give it to us. They're not going to relinquish their power. They're not going to let us be equal with them because their power is being over us. And that, that's just a sickness that has to be dealt with directly. What was your thoughts on that, Dr. Funk? And also, we oftentimes hear people, I've even had friends here that have talked about it, about the importance of voting, and I'm not knocking that, but do you think that there can be any uh, changes made in the system through the power of voting, or is that just like a, we're not going to see that change until we flip the system all the way around? So, yeah. uh, Dr. Funk, I'll do hear from you, and then I'll come back to King Wojak, but... Uh, what are your thoughts about what uh, King said and also whether voting even works? I think um, it's not 100%, but it can help. You know, it's just like when you're cooking, you know, you don't want to put too much salt in there, but you got to put something in there to help. You know, because you have this voting system, it can help, but at the point we are right now, I don't think it's a hundred percent, but we got to start somewhere, you know? And yeah, it's true. We have people in this world that use the whole system of slavery in every aspect of this country. And the thing is, it's not just some people Sometimes it's all people, you know, you go to work and work for somebody, they're going to try to get as much they can out of you without paying you, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's slavery, mm -hmm. pretty much. Because if you don't do what they say, they're going to fire you. You know, as opposed to, you know, you own your own business and you have the power. But a lot of people misuse the power, just like in the music industry. You got a lot of moguls in the mu music industry that uses you. You know, they want to tell you how to be. This is the type of artist you're going to be, what type of songs to sing. And OK, I'll give you this amount of money. They take your money. just like they did with Uncle George, George Clinton, until his kids got old enough to be lawyers. And they got his money back. Mm -hmm. I was so proud of him. You know, because they were ripping drugs off because they kept him on so many drugs. With any kind of drug he wanted, they gave it to him. Yeah. So the man was high for 20 years. Mm. And they, he was signing stuff. He didn't know what he was signing. Wow. And they ripped him off. But when his kids, they're older now and they're lawyers, they got that man's money back. I'm like, you know what? That's pride. That's family. You know? So this whole system that they have here in the United States, like King said, we're going to have to take, we have to take the cancer out. How you doing, Kimberly? We have to take that cancer out and start fresh. You know? Because what they did to us as black people, they're doing the same thing to Latinos. They did the same thing to Chinese people that came over here. The same thing to East Indian. You know? And it's no, no wonder why the Irish always want to fight everybody. Because they don't care. I know some Irish people, real Irish. They don't care what color you are. White, black. If you do something wrong, they own it. You know, and people understand there's a certain code that you have to live by, you mm -hmm. know? And that code is non-existent in Washington. Mm -hmm. 
because they don't care who they cut. They don't care yeah. who you are. If I hear you, King Go Jack, what are some of your thoughts about what uh, Dr. Funk was saying? I got to bounce. I got another call I got to do. It's a pleasure, King. Pleasure to meet you, Mark. I think I'll see you again later. Yeah, later. But I got another call I got to do. Uh, peace. All right. Appreciate you there. Um, we lost your audio and everything, uh, King Will Jackson. Hopefully you can get that audio back for me. And also, I don't know what was going on there because I'm not hearing you, but you were definitely dropping a lot of fire and all of that. So definitely uh, hoping that we can get that audio back with uh, King Will Jack. I know that, uh, oh, there we go. I'm hearing you again. So that's a good thing. So okay, I'm, I'm back. Are we back? Yep. Yep, you're back. You're back loud and clear. Uh, actually, Kimberly, was, who was one of our producers, was hearing a lot of what you had to say and was definitely agreeing a lot with what you were saying and things of that nature. But um, what are some of your thoughts about the importance of voting? I had mentioned that to Dr. Funk, and he was saying that he does find some use for it in uh, the system. But I know that sometimes you want to shake things up even more than what the system wants to be shaken up. So I just wanted your thoughts on the importance of voting. And also the other thing I was curious about that Dr. Funk referred to was about the uh, industry. Cause I do agree that the industry needs a lot of improvement and that a lot of times it uses up you entertainers. So if you could talk to both of those issues if you can. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for as far as voting, man, um, you know, like I said, I have to make sure I keep my voice down around because I'm in the backyard of my at my house, and I don't want my neighbors to know that there's this radical black guy living next door. And what is he talking about? But as far as voting goes, um, it's a game, and the game makers of Monopoly, I, I don't know if they play the game themselves. But I know that they're making millions off the game being sold and people playing the game of Monopoly and trying to run the world and own the world and run business. But the makers of Monopoly who are sitting in the highest of the high places, they know that this is a game. So they play into both sides of the parties, the Democrats and Republicans, and they make them fight. And these guys are all like it's, it's almost like your mother and father fighting. And us kids have to sit down in the living room and overhear them fighting over the pettiest things. And knowing that at some point, this, we're going to have to move because the house is going to be divided between these two. And there's going to be fighting and police being called and, and, and domestic violence in this household. So this is the same going on with America. We've got two presidents, two people fighting like kids in the, over, over kid issues and We've got COVID, we've got racism, we've got white supremacy, we've got all types of other issues we need to be addressing, and they're not even addressing it. So why should I even pay attention or even want to vote for any of this BS that they're trying to put in office? At 50 years old, I'm, I'm the president of Mark Womack, okay? I run me. And I've been doing this, and I, and I, I, you know, I go get my job, I go eat, I run my own country. I don't need a president to run nothing that i do i don't know what you know i know they it's a business though they have to keep this business of america open but it's been such a a, a a gigantic game show that how can we the people even believe that this is working for either or one of either sides that's where the people are at they're like the the democrats ain't working for us republicans is like the you know vice versa nobody's working for each other it's a big game bro and i don't really care for it it sounds like it sounds like there's definitely a uh, big game and all of that. Um, actually, Kim was saying that they don't that we don't need a president. We need a leader. And there is a big yes. difference between a president and a leader. So yes. I would agree with both of y'all on that. If you would, could you talk about also and I know Dr. Funk referred to it earlier, but could you also talk about the um, importance of um, the way the music industry is and all of that, because I definitely agree that the music industry has done a lot of things that were not that great in terms of supporting their artists. So I'd love to hear you talk about your thoughts on that. I really, today, Mark Womack, I can't subscribe to the music industry after knowing uh, about the sacrifices you have to make to be amongst the music industry greats. 
the things you have to do behind the scenes, the contracts you have to sign, the, 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 the rituals you have to attend, the meetings you have to be a part of, the people you have to be around. This thing is, I, I, and I chased the music industry for a good solid 15 years as a youth. Going down to Hollywood, California, trying to live there, I was offered the drugs. I was uh, offered cocaine on plates. I was offered marijuana. And, and so me, I, I, I didn't want to be a part of that. I seen it early on that this is what you have to do to be, to be an artist, to be famous, to make it. I'm cool. I don't want to be a part of it. So I, at 50, I still do music because I love music, because I love the vibration of it. I love, and I know that there are a few people that will be listening to some true talk that I, you know, that I release. But as far as being in the music industry, trying to get signed, trying to be on the next stage, trying to be the America's Next uh, Got Talent type of guy, I just, I'm done with that. And I feel sorry for the youth that are still trying to pursue that dream without knowing the knowledge of the industry today and what they do to kids and, and what they do to people, uh, to women, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the children. Uh, we, uh, one day, me and my brother were contacted by this company, and I can't remember the company's name, but they were a modeling agency who needed some judges for their modeling agency event down in California. So we were booked. We uh, got our flights paid for. We uh, ended up showing up at this event and being judges. And what I seen early on, is uh, a lot of pedophilia in the making, a lot mm -hmm. of it. This was in the early, two. this is like 2004 or five, 2003 or four or five, you know what I mean, around that time. And so we didn't fit in into this, this, this organization that they had. I don't know how we got chosen to even be a part of it, but it was almost like if we would have came down there and, 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 and been a part of this, who knows where I would be today if I, decided to subscribe to pedophilia and, 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 and children and trying to promote people's children because that's all they were doing. I had, and then after we left that event, we had parents who were so desperate to get their kids into the music industry. They thought that me and my brother were some type of big superstar producers. And so they were sending us headshots. They were sending us uh, proposals. If you guys will pay you this much, if you, you know, I couldn't do it, man. And I could have easily took, a couple hundred thousand dollars from some people just by playing with their kids. I just couldn't do it. We dropped the ball on it. I had a stack of headshots of kids, pictures and photos and things like that from all across the United States, rich kids, rich parents who wanted their kids to be something. And from there on, I just knew the industry was not all there. It's just not hey, Doug, all there, bro. Yeah, yeah. King Bojack, I'm hearing you. And I know that one of my supporters and somebody that is also a big time supporter of this station is one of our executive producers. And she's actually very big on that. She also believes that a lot of times our entertainment industry has been very corrupt in the way they have treated the performers and things of that nature. So I want to introduce you to Kim Calhoun. Kim Calhoun is here with us and she was definitely hearing a lot of what you had to say. And I know that she's talked about that as well, just the way that we ruin a lot of kids' lives in the entertainment world. So I'm sure that she, like myself, I'm glad to hear you speak the truth about what goes on in the industry. And we probably need to hear more of this. I mean, we hear about that kind of what went on with Epstein, but you're saying that you actually had an experience where you saw some of that directly and in your own life, not that long ago when you were a judge and all of that. So Kim, mm -hmm. meet King, King Wojak, King Wojak, meet Kim. Wow. What an honor. And Mark, as always, I'm so blown away with who is on your show. And I, as you know, I had an emergency today, um, but I wanted to get on because what you speak about is so real and so true. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't know this, but um, domestic Kim, violence. Kim, Kim, hold on before you go. I, Mark, my phone, this, listen, I've had some horrible problems with my phone the last week. I dropped it in the water. My major say, I, iPhone that I usually use is, is out of commission. So I have to charge this old one that, that I'm using now. So what I'm going to do is unplug and listen. And then when you want me to plug back in, I'm going to unplug from the charger and plug back in and talk. But it's your turn to talk, Miss Kim. I'm here to listen. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for being on. 
So let's talk about this. I mean, you're such a powerful voice and have got such a, a talent. But um, a work, you know, I'm an engineer by trade. So put that phone that went in the water into rights. I tried um, that. Dry it up. I, I am a technician by heart. So okay. let's let's uh, talk about some of these interesting things. First off, domestic violence: twelve million female victims per year, ten thousand fatalities. It's going up thanks to COVID. Um, but these are voices we need to hear. And as I keep saying in a world where we are divided, you know, they keep making us fight in black and white. I have, I have always only seen gray. And some of the things that you talk about hit a chord with me. They, they, they hit a big enough chord that I beamed in. <laughs> so, you know, Scotty, beam me in. Mark, beam me in. Um, you know, science fiction is true. Um, I take back what I said on the stage a couple of years ago during a speech that I gave that that's one thing we haven't done yet. But let's talk about this. Let's talk about the needs of what we need to do to achieve our our ultimate goals for quality of life. Because that is what we're really aiming for. I mean, we talk about Black Lives Matters. You know, that's very important. When we talk about why aren't the policies there? You know, everybody, I'm, excuse me, Mark, I'm gonna get on my soapbox. That's okay. but, you know, everybody, you know, yay, Abe Lincoln. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I see this sleight of hand parlor trick. You know, I'm gonna flee, free you slaves. Not one policy was ever made to make you free. Every policy that was put into place after he freed you was to indenture you into slavery. It didn't give you the right to own land. None of the policies gave you right to vote. None of the policies gave you the right to earn equality salaries. And, and this is what I ask people, you know, everybody puts him way up here because he did a sleight of hand parlor trick that I call that, that a lot of these supposed politicians do. But quite honestly, if I were to burn a monument, it'd be his because he did all of this, but he also had servants. And when you read the South history, the, the real deep South history, you know, and, and why all things happen, he was there to indenture you into slavery, just like they do all the other laws, the tax laws, every, every law we have is indenturement. Think about this education. You can get a loan for education. It's going to cost $85,000. That's more than a mortgage. So by the time, you know, I, I have friends, middle class, hardworking Americans, put their kids through college, got them loans so they could become doctors and whatever, cost $200,000. These kids graduate with a $200,000 debt on their back. That's indentured slaves. People, indentured slaves, they can't, they can't do anything till they start paying that debt back. And the, the, what people don't understand is the education debt that we have in this country you can't bankrupt it. Okay. You can't get out of it. There's no way to get out of it. We are not the best system in the world for getting out of debt, for getting out of indentured slavery. So I ask you people, when Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, what policies did he put in place to give you freedom? Yep. You got a good point. Uh, uh, King, if you could, I'd love to hear your comments. I want, your, I want your comment. Plug in, King. He he put no nothing in place. Okay. Uh, so what I wanted to explain to you, because what in mind when you were telling me about that is the thought that we were here, and when they released us to uh, fr fr to freedom, all they did is just move the finish line back a little bit. Okay, and we, and then we had to start running faster and harder just to try to compete and live in this life so just look at us where we're at today they've been moving the finish line back every 10 years on us because every time we figure out that oh, okay we got to do this to get that oh let's just move the finish line back so where's the finish line today we still running trying to catch up to the finish line of the of white supremacy and it's all part of the same system the government white supremacy they're all together they're this if they're in the bed together they wear the same suit so when we have to address the government remember we have to 
white supremacy, the uh, the, the 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 system that became um, in power out of you know our struggle of us trying to be free and live in America. And so it just it's we we have so far to go, and they keep moving the line on us. Well, when are we going to ever be able to catch up? They've they've never put in place. We don't have no land, no money, no power in our life right now and all we're waiting on is another stimulus check to come and help us buy some groceries for the next couple months to keep us quiet <laughs> don't even take me down that road about the stimulus check so let me tell you what makes the difference the difference is policies and not the policies that that grease the squeaky wheel that shut you up i'm talking about the policies that enforce so when you read a policy, don't sit there and go, oh, OK, they're going to do something for me. Read where the enforcement is in there. And if you watch IBM TV, we teach you this. This is what we're teaching. And we're also trying to lift ourselves up so that we can actually help enforce it. So we want to bring the voices together like yours, powerful mm -hmm. voices, talented voices that can bring a message in a way that people will listen. And and because the only Thing that's going to change isn't oh let's you know change taxes let's add taxes no policies okay people policies and laws we got to get the right people in place why do you think the republicans are pushing so hard to put a new supreme court justice person in place she's going to come in and remove everything that the most human person ever that was for equality set laws in place. Mm -hmm. Ginsburg, her whole life was equality. And why are the Republicans so interested in removing everything she did? And we got to ask ourselves that. And, and, and I get so irritated because right now we you don't. Know why. Do, you know what? why, Kim. You know I why. Do. Oh, Say, heck it then. I do. Say it then, Kim. They it's wear the white they don't sheets. Care. <laughs> they wear they the don't white care. sheets, Kim. They, they don't wear care. the white sheets. They okay? don't care about human yeah. equality. They don't care about women's rights. They don't care about black rights. They don't care about Native American rights. They don't care. Okay. And here's what bothers me is we don't need a new Sup Supreme Court justice. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's going to cost us money. In fact, you know, we're talking about shutting down the government because we don't have money. All right. We don't have money to pay a new Supreme Court justice. So why are we focused on that, Mr. President? Why are we not sitting here talking about how we can fix COVID, how we can get you a paying job, how we can get every person out there who is unemployed a paying job? My friend's out there going out driving Uber with a, one arm right now because he mm. needs money. OK. All right. Because no money, no stimulus check came in. And what the hell is a stimulus check? Let's talk about that. I okay? didn't get none of it. The stimulus check is supposed to stimulate. Where did that freaking money go that we, we sent out last time? Wait a minute. Hold on a second. I just heard King Wojak say something that shocked me. Oh, yeah. And everything. Sorry, no, you're good. Uh, Y'all will be having a great conversation. And we still got a few more minutes before I have to wrap up and get to my uh, more terrestrial podcast and everything, which is at seven. But one of the things I was going to say is that uh, did I just hear you, King Wojak, say that you did not receive any stimulus check at all so that you got none whatsoever? At all, sir. I didn't receive any stimulus check because I was a I, I think I'm flagged for owing too much child support, which I am up to date on my child support payments. And so they they, they neglected that. Then child support went after my uh, um, unemployment. So my unemployment has been cut in half by child support and I didn't get any stimulus. So I could complain, complain, complain. But to be honest with you, the Lord has blessed me and kept me afloat during this COVID-19 response. I'm not doing good, but I am not doing bad. So I am blessed and I think that things are going to get better. I think things, I, I don't need the government money. I just need an idea of how to reestablish myself in society, not as a rapper, but maybe more as a political spokesman or something that's bigger that pays that's legit that i can actually use my brain my intelligence my knowledge wisdom and understanding to create a better path for myself and build a future for my family and so 
if it I don't think it's music, but I still have the talent and the and the, the love for it. But I just don't want to, you know, be rapping and, and competing with kids and and be on the spotlight target because of these things that I speak about so intelligently on the mic. Yeah. You got the brain. Dave, you got a brain. Got That's the an amazing thing. I'm just so glad you got that great brain, that great voice, and all of that. And actually, uh, Kim, you will be glad to know that both King Wojak and Dr. Funk were amazed that we have an investment show on the uh, station here. And both of them said that they would like to be in touch with Sasha because they have some ideas of some things, including schools. Both of them have school ideas, both King Wojak in. Uh, the Washington area and Dr. Funk in California that would incorporate music and the arts and entrepreneurship that they need some help with investment. So uh, just letting you know, uh, Kim, that we need to put them in touch with Sasha because they are very much interested in learning about the world of investment. So let me add one more thing. One of the missions when we started the first TV show before we incorporated this network was to close the gap between poverty and sustainability. Right. It's a huge gap. And our idea was to inspire financial literacy. And that's what we're doing. Frederick Hendricks uh, had, um, is going to be doing a TV show on financial literacy. So, uh, Kim, uh, you might want to join us on that and help bring a voice for that, for the people with your voice, because your voice brings the people in. And that's what we wanted to do is bring these voices, these people in to inspire them. None of this cost anything. No, this is free. And I guess he left us. And yeah, I uh, think he bounced out. Yeah, he had, he had, he had some honor. problems with everything. But definitely he may come back in the next uh, few minutes or everything. And I do have some spots of some of our other shows. But by the way, I did get a chance to watch Wynn's show earlier today, Win with Win. It was truly amazing. I was just amazed with all of that. Her premiere episode. And I thought that that was a great premiere episode. I know she was a little worried there because she was looking for a guest and then you popped in at some point as well because you're always no, there. <laughs> that three was back on a regular basis. So I saw that she had her premiere episode. I believe Gwen Hurt, who also popped in here a minute ago and I was I invited her to pop in to talk about her show. But I know she had her premiere episode last Friday. So we've got a number of great shows that are going on here on a regular basis. We've got Travel with Brandon and we've got a number of other things that are happening all the time, including Talking Upstream. I'm just amazed at the amazing folks that we have gotten to do our shows here on just doing a great job. You missed it earlier. I know you had that medical appointment, but Deidre was also quite impressed and we had a lovely conversation before this one about music, about the importance of documentaries. They are actually an Academy Award winning judging the festival. So like you said, if you see the documentaries that are getting Academy Awards, they have to go through full frame among other festivals in order to even get that nomination. So they are having that title and everything. So she talked about that and how that's an important thing. And she did talk about the pivot that has existed because of what's going on with COVID. So we're all pivoting different ways wow. in order to survive. So I know I even wanna, on our network, we're still I want to say thank you, Mark, because you have been the solid voice for IBM TV. Um, you definitely understand the necessity of bringing out public service announcements. Mm -hmm. You understand the necessity of bringing out the word that the people need to hear. And I want to thank you, Mark. Because you are here all the time for us. You're supporting. You know what it takes to give, to, to be that backbone, um, to always be there when we need you. But also, I want to tell you, I'm going to try to be here when you need me. Because that's what makes the team, right? Oh, yeah. That's what, <laughs> what unites us, what makes us grow together and unite as one world. Because we are not here just for us. It's like Tommy Harris says, I'm going to, I'm going to send this tape to you. Tommy Harris, NFL, one of the, the best defense players in the NFL. He says, it's not about us. It's about us, 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 right? It's not yep. about you. It's not about me. It's about us, us, us. Yep. And that video of his speech is amazing. He's also one of the best musicians I've ever heard, aside from the best and highest paid defense player in the NFL. So, I, I just want to say, you know, we're all here, but Mark, you're solid. You're thank a solid you. voice. And no, thank you. Now, I want to say thank you. You're a solid voice. 
for what's right. Thank you. And I haven't met your mom yet. I'm going to call her now that I'm getting better. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to talk to her because I'm going to tell her what a great son she has. Well, thank you. I definitely thank appreciate you. that. And I love the vision that you and Nick have put together. And I try to share that with my friends and others. I just have been amazed with what y'all have put together. And like I said, I've met some folks that I would not have met through this platform, including my new friend, Alexandria, over there in uh, South Africa, my new friend, Sharif, over there in Malaysia. So definitely uh, Ben Coates over there in England. So I have this global community that I might not have had before because of the, well, the folks that I've met. And that's just a few of those that I have met through the network. So definitely I have to thank you as well because y'all have just done a great job in creating this platform. And I'm looking forward to it even growing bigger and better. I know that our goal is to get to 100 shows. And I think that every time I look on, there's a new and amazing show that is there, whether that's win with win. I did see earlier today, um, Fred talking about uh, Financial Fridays, and I did get a chance to watch a little bit of that. So they're doing great things with that. So they're just doing some great things here on the network. And I just thought that y'all have done a great job. And we've got some more amazing guests that I'm lining up. I've been in contact, you'll be glad to know, with Floyd. So somebody's going to pop in, but definitely yeah, might pop in on the online dinner party. Bring me on, party. Bring me on yep. Floyd. You know, he wrote a letter uh, of uh, a recommendation for me. So definitely bring me in when he comes in. I would love to say hi to him. And I want that Brian guy. Hey, I want Brian yeah, yeah. with bun dancing. I want to do bun dancing and we'll get King Bo Wojak and we'll do yeah. bun dancing one night. We'll so definitely we'll have to get that going on. We got about just a few more minutes and then I need to wrap everything up. But King Wojak, I did want to hear from you any final thoughts that you've got and everything about all that we've been talking about. We were actually talking about the network here that we've got, and it is an amazing family and all of that. So definitely that's going on. I do just to give one quick shout out to Kim about something that we share, which is a love of the Vikings. They did win, so we did get at least one victory. The Vikings have been doing really bad this year, so they played against another bad team, which was Houston. So, But we did get at least one victory, whereas y'all got good teams over there on the West Coast. So, King Bojack, what are some of your thoughts? And I'd love to have you share some of your final thoughts in the next few minutes or whatever. Listen, I don't even have a few minutes. I just, my phone died on me, and I just charged it for a little bit. I got a, maybe a, a half a minute. Uh, thank you for having me on this show again. Like I say, I'm, I, I'm love to uh, give my view of things and, uh, and not on a hip hop aspect, just on a, a pure um, intellectual aspect. And thank you, Kim, for jumping on. And uh, hopefully we can talk again. Send me the information to my email about the financial uh, planner and the investor and stuff. I want my mother-in-law to look in on it as well. Um, and we just want to just continue to grow as a community. And this is the only way I feel like we can grow is by just having meetings, talking. And uh, hopefully this is reaching hundreds and thousands of people. And they can go to kingwouniverse.com, pick up a Warzone album, as always. Just something to let, you know, kill the time until I come out with a real more powerful well-produced album but i would hope that i can just you know produce and, and sell a few albums just off this this podcast this great podcast mark and lee appreciate you guys god bless thank you for having me on and let's talk again soon about whatever whenever sounds Bye, great man. and i appreciate you giving us that support and that love and definitely we will have you back on again because you always spit that fire as i call folks that like to speak the truth and you are always glad to spit the fire and tell folks what needs to be heard. So once again, I do want to thank you for joining us once again. And I do know that you will be back on again. If you're not careful, Kim is going to recruit you to do a show because Kim likes folks with good voices and she might have you doing a show as well. So if you're willing to uh, lend your voice from the West Coast and she's not afraid of folks that got passion and that are afraid to talk about issues because like I said, she knows I will talk issues. She knows Bill Presbot will talk at you, so she does not mind folks doing that. So don't, don't be contact careful. Don't. me. I don't mind it. I, I if I, I do definitely have the time. I'm sitting around doing nothing. So uh, maybe you can direct I'll put me, me to work. Thinking. Put me to work. Let's 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 uh, get I'll, some issues let's and things Let's go to work going. together, Rojack. Let's go to work. Let's, let's do work. it. Let's contact do it. me. I'll be ready to work. I am here. I, I'm more than happy to help and lend my game on expertise. Game on. I'm going to bring Alrighty. some people to the table. Game on. You got it. All right. All right. Thank I'm you, Mr. Lee. I'm going to bow out.
Cool. You're getting ready to bounce out. I think you got to bow it as well because, you know, in about five minutes, I've got to do my show with your good buddy, Dean, Dean Geronimo. So we've got to talk about the world on what my friend of mine jokingly calls Mark's Podcast Monday because, you know, I started at 2 o'clock. Well, actually, I start at about 9 now because I start watching Win and then I watch y'all till 2. And then from 2 until 9, I'm doing this kind of amazing kind of program. And so a friend of mine on the phone said, yeah, I forgot because they were trying to reach me last Monday. And they're like, dang, I knew that was Mark's Monday, Mark's Pod Monday, and you can't reach me on that day. So they realized that. Dean. I love Dean's voice. So give him my heart. And I'm going to go uh, rest and get ready for tomorrow. Take Sounds care. Good. Yep. Bye. Once again, that was another amazing show, and it was great having Kim pop in and everything and share her thoughts and wisdom as well. So definitely appreciate her joining us and talking about some things that were on her mind as well. And we did get a lot of great information that was shared and a great a lot of great knowledge. So definitely I was glad to hear those compliments from her as well as uh, hear the voice of both Dr. Funk and King Wojak. And earlier on the radio show with Mark Lee, we heard from none other than Deidre Hodge, the director of the Full Frame Film Festival. And that was another great conversation as well. So definitely looking forward to having another one on this coming Wednesday. That's right. We're going to have some amazing guests pop in on the online dinner party. And like I promised uh, the man with the mind closet, the international guest will be somebody, I don't know who yet, from Nigeria. So I'm going to find me a Nigerian for my international mystery guest. And of course, we'll find a mystery guest in the world of some kind of pop culture. It might even be an athlete, or it might be somebody in entertainment, or in the world of crime, or maybe I'll find a union person. But it'll be somebody representing the spirit of the... Uh, United States and North America. So try to find somebody from this area as well as somebody from the rest of the globe. So two mystery guests and you know one of them will be from Nigeria. I don't know who that will be yet, but that is who one of the mystery guests will be and I'll do some research on that. And then we'll have other great guests as usual. So glad that Eris is providing me some guests as are some folks connected with LSX and a number of other folks. And by the way, don't forget, if you've got an event going on, we are here at IBM.TV are also able to host and help your event. So if you've got an event going on, you can get in touch with me, you can get in touch with Kim, you can get in touch with Ankit, and we can make that happen. So like, if you've got a virtual event, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us, and we can definitely help you do that. So definitely keep that in mind, because I know a number of folks are going to virtual events right now. And speaking of right now, I'm here to bring up some of the uh, other shows that exist. And then I'm going to jump on the phone because the other one is more of the radio version, which means it's going to be on the phone and not in this streaming platform. And I'm going to do the show with Dean. And I will tell Dean that uh, Kim said hello and all of that. But that being said, and of course, we also want Brian back on as well because she's a big fan of that. But right now, I'm going to let you check out The Investment Show, which is another one of Sasha's shows that I was alluding to, as well as Win with Win. So these are some of our shows. And then I'm going to jump on Straight Talk with Dean and Mark on Blog Talk Radio. But right now, let's see what this is all about with Sasha's Investment Show. <music>
Jack as well as Dr. Funk on that show. So we were having an engaging conversation and all of that. And by the way, you will be glad to know that none other than Kim Calhoun popped in on that show as well. And she was saying how much she enjoys that voice of yours. So she needs to hear those voice maybe on some spots or some other things happening on the network. So just letting folks know that that's going to happen. As a matter of fact, they might even hear me making this plea for you to get those spots. Because like I said, I'm wrapping up that show. So as I'm talking to you, they are also hearing me say these same things on the air and everything because I'm here to hit the in broadcast, but they do know that they want you and your voice because Kim is a big fan of your voice. She thinks that it's an amazing voice, and I know that she would love to have you join and give some of that fine uh, melodic tones of your voice on some of the things that are happening on IBM.TV. So, you know, we got that going on, and that's what's happening. And, of course, she is a fan of yours, and we just had some great conversations about a number of things going on in the community. So, like I said, she is an amazing lady, and definitely was glad to have her pop in and talk to King Wojak and Dr. Funk. So, we had that going on, and it was just a fun conversation. And, like I said, she is definitely a fan of yours as well. And I know that that is a shared fandom because I know that you are also a supporter of some of the things that goes on. And of course, we do air some of the programming right here on our radio network as well. <laughs> And you know, I told you sometime back that I had done contact tracing, and I was always told.